All right, so it looks like we have, uh, in addition to the 10 panelists, uh, we have 22 attendees uh, on the call, which is great to see. Um, so my name is Steve Coleman. I am the co-chair of the uh, Public Safety Building Capital Campaign Committee, uh, and I'll be uh, sort of moderating the, the event tonight uh, just to make sure we, we move through the agenda and uh, we kind of make sure that we get all of your questions answered. So before I turn it over to uh, Rob to introduce um, you know, his committee um, and the people that uh, will be addressing uh, any questions tonight and be handling the presentation, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what the format is is going to be. So uh, we'll have an introductory of the committee members, um, as in, including the architects uh, and the uh, project manager. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the current fire station and police needs. We'll uh, talk about the proposed uh, public safety building design, uh, and that will be handled uh, by Rebecca. Um, Donna Foglio. Uh, our financial officer uh, for the town is on the call, uh, so she can answer any questions uh, relative uh, to the tax increase uh, or the funding mechanism for this project. Um, Noreen um, Johnson will talk a little bit about the fundraising efforts and the work of the Capital Campaign Committee. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity at the end for questions uh, and answers. So the way that we are doing the um, the forum tonight and the way that we're gonna handle the question and the an and answers is, is, is we wanna make sure that we give as many forums as possible uh, for people to be able to ask questions. So uh, this Zoom as we speak is being live streamed on the Town of Charlton's Facebook page. And it is also being live streamed on the Charlton Public Safety Building Facebook page, as well as uh, this Zoom call that people had the link and they signed on. So there's three mechanisms where the public can ask their questions. Our town administrator, uh, Andrew Golis, will be monitoring the town of Charlton's Facebook page for questions. Rob Barton will be monitoring the Charlton Public Safety Building uh, Facebook page for any questions that are posed in the comments section there. And then I will be monitoring the chat forum of this Zoom call. If you ask a question on either of the Facebook pages, uh, those questions will be copied and pasted by Andrew or Rob, and they will be dropped into the Zoom chat. So I can see those here and we can ensure that we get all of the questions answered. There is no time limit on this forum tonight. Um, so once the presentations are done, uh, we'll be on and, until uh, we answer all of the questions that the public may have. Um, and, and again, we're, we're on this call and until no, no one has any questions. So with that said, uh, Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. It looks like Rebecca has uh, joined us again. Rebecca, is your microphone issue squared away? She's on mute right now. Yes, I think it is. Can you guys hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, Rob, at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you for introduction of your committee and then um, right into the agenda on the discussion of the uh, current facilities. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Rob Byron. I uh, am a member of the uh, Public Safety Building Committee, and I am a, a captain on the uh, Charlton Fire Department. Um, I'm the secretary of this uh, building committee. I just... You know, I'm one that's uh, answering a lot of the questions on the social media, stuff like that. So the chairman of the committee is also on, uh, Ralph Fisk. Uh, other members of the committee that are on is the uh, fire chief, Ed Knopf, the interim police chief, uh, Dan Dowd, uh, police officer, Derek Gaylord, uh, another captain on the fire department, uh, Brian Ouellette. Uh Obviously, our town administrator, Andrew Gullis, uh, sits on the committee as well. And then um, really the brains behind this whole project are the, uh, the OPMs who are the owners, project managers for us. They are kind of our, our liaison, they work for us um, and they uh, sort of are our voice to the architect and to the, uh, to the bidding process. So uh, John Lemieux is on and Kevin Heffernan is on. And then we also have our architect team um, that was hired by the town, uh, Tecton Architects. 
and uh, Rebecca Hopkins is in the front and then in the back waving is uh, Jeff McElravey um, is on as well. So I have a uh, PowerPoint that I will end to share and then we can kind of start moving our way through the process. I'm a little a lot less slow on this. All right. So I assume everybody can see this. We are good to go, some thumbs up, okay. Um, all right, so this is actually the design of the building. This is the uh, initial picture of the building. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get right into it. So we're gonna start by talking about the, the Charlton Fire Department and then it goes into the Charlton Police Department and then we'll talk about the proposed building. And once we get into the proposed building, then uh, Rebecca will take over, kind of start figuring out or answering people's questions of how we got to where building design we're in. So this is our very first fire station. If you don't know it, it's on Route 20. Um, it's actually Burt Gale's um, uh, gas station. He stored our first fire truck in there in 1924. Um, our second fire truck was put in there in 1941 and it operated, it, it held our buildings until the flood of 1955. Um, after that, the building, that building was destroyed, destroyed the originally, and they built our original fire headquarters, which is what we have now, Charlton City over on 10 Power Station Road. This building was built in 1958. It was originally a, a three bay, one story building. Uh, it was never intended for full-time firefighters uh, in 1968. They added two additional bays because of uh, space needs. And this was one of the, uh, the original photos back in the 68. That building still exists today. This is the headquarters. This is the only manned fire station that we have. The uh, second floor of the building was put on 1986 by um, high school um, students up at Bay Path. Um, they came down, put the second floor on because we started to go to a full-time department and we needed additional space for offices and um, meeting rooms and, and kitchen and stuff like that. There was a uh, some damage that took place in 2009. Some severe ice dams took place on, on the roof, caused extensive damage to the second floor. We only bring that up because there are some people that have gone up to the second floor of this building, uh, the fire station, and they say, oh, it looks really nice. Um, it was uh, redone back in 09 with an insurance claim due to the uh, large amount of black mold that existed um, upstairs. Again, it was never uh, this, back then they had full-time firefighters, but they were never there overnight. Um, once we started in 2009, once they started going to overnight 24 hour coverage, they had to add some bunk rooms. So then they, uh, they just chopped up some of the open space, which were just an open meeting room. Um, they chopped it up and made some bunk rooms for uh, everybody. In case you were wondering, this is actually what um, the apparatus that runs out of fire headquarters. It's two of our engines, engine two and engine three. Um, engine three is our newest engine. Our new one is actually on the way. Um, engine three had to be custom built in order to fit into the building. It's a very tight squeeze, both uh, height, um, the length of the building and the width. A3, one of our ambulances, ambulance one. Our forestry truck is also out of this um, station and uh, the white, SUV, the white Tahoe, we call it car nine. It parks outside. That vehicle is sort of our chase vehicle. It goes to uh, medicals. It gives just an extra set of hands at our medicals to uh, help extricate the person and provide uh, care. So this is our parking lot. If you didn't know all of the dirt part of the parking lot that you see adjacent to the fire station, that's actually not our land. That belongs to that building right behind you in the, uh, on the image on the screen. We lease that land from that uh, the land owner of that building um, to allow us to park our vehicles. The only thing that the town owns is the uh, pavement um, area of the building, which is enough for about six parking spaces, um, depending on uh, what vehicles, size of vehicles are parking there. But uh, we only have space for about six vehicles there. 
So this is actually some of the concerns that we have, and these are sort of our needs. Um, the inadequate space for the firefighters exists. It's very difficult for firefighters to walk in between the vehicles and the turnout gear that hangs on the wall. Our turnout gear hangs very close to the front doors, and as the doors are open on the nice days, or uh, we keep the, try to keep the doors open for ventilation and air quality. Um, unfortunately, the sun comes through and degrades the turnout gear that's pretty close to that um, entrance. There's, there's no other option that we have. If a firefighter uh, is getting dressed to go out on a call and another firefighter comes in to get dressed and his gear is beyond that original firefighter, um, they have to kind of do this little dance in order to get around the, uh, the first firefighter in order so everybody can get their gear on. It's just a little bit of a delay. We have trouble opening up our cabinet doors in order to um, check the trucks, especially during inclement weather. A lot of the times we have to pull our trucks out just to um, check the equipment. And then obviously when we're uh, washing the uh, vehicles, um, we unfortunately tend to get the, uh, the turnout gear wet and uh, wet turnout gear going into a house fire is not really a good thing. Here's some of the other um, problems that we have. The picture on our left is actually our, our washer and dryer that we used for, um, we used to actually use the washer and dryer there to, to take care of our contaminated uh, turnout gear. It's just those are residential washer and uh, dryers. Uh, since um, then, or since this photo, we've actually installed a gear extractor. We'll talk about the difference between those, but this is our washer dryer. That's our, our water heater on the left-hand side. It's just shoved into the back corner of the uh, fire station. The other picture, that's our only shower um, for the uh, fire station. There are five firefighters that are working at one time. So if all five firefighters go to a structure fire and we come back contaminated with all the carcinogens that we, uh, we deal with on the fire ground scene, um, the firefighters uh, rotate through the uh, shower one at a time in order to uh, clean themselves and, and get all the contaminants off as quickly as we can. It's just not adequate enough for us um, with the new dangers that we're, uh, we're dealing with. Picture on the left is our lobby. Um, if, you, if you haven't been into the lobby, that's it. It's sort of a catch-all. Um, we added a, a desk there to greet the public. They just put up some uh, plexiglass uh, glass dividers in order to protect ourselves in the public from you know, the coronavirus uh, that we're dealing with. And then, then that open door that you see there, that's that picture on the right-hand side. That's our new gear extractor. Due to the space needs of uh, what that piece of equipment requires, that's the only place that we could put it. Um, so that this room that you're looking at used to, or it actually is our safe storage room. Uh, safe stands for Student Awareness Fire Education. It, uh, all those bins in the background, that's all the stuff that we bring into the classrooms, into the schools. Um, that's our uh, bottled water that we, uh, we get donated to us and stuff. So the problem is, is our contaminated gear comes off the fire apparatus floor and then we carry it through the lobby. Um, so we're carrying contaminated gear through the lobby and then we kind of pile it in that doorway because we can wash two sets of gear at a time. Um, if the five duty firefighters go, well, that's you know five sets, but we'll have off-duty firefighters that come in. So sometimes we have to wash, you know, 10, 11 sets of gear, and then the gear just sort of gets piled up there um, while, we, uh, while we wash the gear. And it's obviously not the uh, ideal situation at all. So that's our headquarters station. This is our station two. If you don't know, this is uh, up on North Main Street. Um, this building, it was originally built in 1929 as a highway barn. Fire department started taking it over in 1970 when we got our, our first surplus military vehicle and we didn't have anywhere to put it. Headquarters was filled up. So um, they asked highway department back then if we could borrow a bay. And then we eventually uh, took over all four bays. And if you've been in town long enough, you remember the, the highway building that was behind the station was just uh, a couple of Quonset huts. That's where they stored the vehicles. The buildings were attached and by the buildings being attached, they allowed the firefighters um, if they were up there doing, you know, vehicle checks or whatever to use the highway department's building for a bathroom. A few years ago, or I don't know, probably 10 years now, they, when they built the, uh, the new highway garage, they actually tore down the old building, the old highway building. And then that left us with some problems. So it, it's had some paint um, put onto it. Uh, it is an unmanned station. That's one of the questions that um, we've been getting. It is an unmanned station. It's just four garage bays and it, and it stores five apparatus. Um, pay no attention to the letters and numbers on the outside of the building, um, but engine one, our third engine is up there. Uh, tanker two, 
our only tanker truck for the town is up there. Ambulance too, our uh, third out ambulance is kept up there as well and our heavy rescue or rescue one. Marine one is stored up there. It's actually um, sitting um, parallel to the road behind the T6 building and the E5 um, bay door. T6 bay door and E5 bay door. It's actually parallel behind the two apparatus. So in the event that we have a, a, a water incident, a water emergency, um, a boating accident, a boat fire, uh, drowning, um, we have to go up there. We have to take those two vehicles out, the ambulance parks in the T6 building or bay door and the tanker parks in the E5 bay door. We take those two vehicles out and that allows us to shimmy the uh, boat out behind those two um, vehicles. And then um, we hook up the vehicle to our, to the vehicle that's being towed and we respond. Uh, last month, uh, another town near us uh, called us for our boat for dive activation for uh, a drowning that took place. Um, I just happened to look at the timesheet to see how long it took for the fire department to respond from fire headquarters up to this station, um, shimmy the boat out and actually get it hooked up and respond. And it was an eight minute delay um, in order to get that boat even on the road. Um, and then it obviously has to travel to wherever it has to. This is actually a common occurrence that we have to do uh, very frequently. This is um, the firefighters up there pushing the water out of those four bays. We pull the vehicles out and then we just start pushing the water out. Water just runs in off the hood. I mean, off the, uh, off the hill behind the fire station. Um, there's been multiple attempts to try to fix this so that way water doesn't come in. Um, if you can see right here, there's actually a, a, there used to be a pump in there. They inserted a pump, but the pump burnt out um, just due to the uh, constant work that it has. They've had to build some dry wells for the oil tanks. Um, but this is a common occurrence. And unfortunately, the vehicles just sit up there and it's just so moist up there and so wet that the, um, the undercarriage of the vehicles end up with a lot of uh, more damage. We have to replace exhaust systems, um, brake lines, brake pads, rotors, stuff like that, just because of rust, because it's just such a, a moist environment up there. There's really nothing we can do. There's extensive uh, structural damage as well, uh, or deficiency, not damage, there's extra, uh, structural deficiency as well. Um, to the building, it's, it's beyond repair. After the highway, like I said, left in 2008, they took down the Quonset hut, which took down the bathroom. Um, because there's a town bylaw that says all town uh, buildings must actually have a, a toilet. Um, this is actually the means to get around that town bylaw. So they added a uh, porta potty up there um, for the public to use uh, if need be. Again, people say all the time, it's not a staff station. Um, why do you need running water? Why do you need a toilet? There are firefighters up there um, several times in a week um, for several hours doing functions on the uh, fire trucks up there. Um, and in the event that they need to use the bathroom or wash their hands because their hands get contaminated with gasoline or oil and stuff, they don't have a means to do that. They actually have to head back down to fire headquarters to respond. I'm just gonna back up real quick um, to this slide. People say all the time, well, it's an unmanned station. What's the big deal? But the problem is, is our rescue can get um, requested to go to uh, the Mass Turnpike Route 20 for a motor vehicle accident. That vehicle carries our dive equipment as well as all of our heavy rescue equipment, our airbags, our jaws of life. Um, firefighters will come in from home. If they're off duty, they'll respond to headquarters. They'll get their firefighting gear. They'll hop back in another vehicle. They'll respond up to this station and then they'll respond with that rescue one. Um, the same goes for the tanker. If the tank, if we have a fire in town, we need uh, to get a lot of water on scene. Same thing, firefighters respond in from home to headquarters, get their turnout gear, hop back in the vehicle, come up to the station, and then hop in tanker too. So there is a delay in response to these, um, these calls with these uh, specific vehicles. Um, behind uh, the station, behind that station too, there's these uh, special response trailers. Uh, the town of Charlton has five of them. One of them is a regional response vehicle. So TriEpic, DPH, Hazmat Response, um, and Emergency Management are all, uh, well, the DPH trailer is a, a regional asset as well. When we do the uh, flu clinics or in the event of some um, shelter requirement, it's, those are the vehicles, the trailers that would have to get towed. And there's also this technical rescue trailer that is a regional asset trailer that can go all over uh, Southern Worcester County and it has all of the rope rescue equipment on there. The problem with it is that is, is the trailers are exposed. The trailers just sit outside and unfortunately with the snow and the weather in New England that we have, um, we recently ran into a problem where two of the trailers got destroyed um, just because the ceilings 
buckled underneath the weight of the snow, caused a lot of water to leak inside, and then eventually just uh, got everything moldy inside. So we had to get uh, two trailers replaced. So this is what we call fire station number three. Um, this is across the street from our fire headquarters over on Power Station Road. This is a, uh, it's a Quonset hut. It was, um, the building itself is actually on leased land. It's on the land uh, is leased to the uh, residents to the right of it. Um, they were gracious enough to allow us to put this building on their property. Family history in the fire department, a grandfather to the resident that lives there now um, was on our department as a deputy fire chief. Built in 2005 by the prisoners from the uh, House of Corrections out in Worcester um, as part of a community project. Uh, our Tower One million dollar ladder truck sits inside that building. The truck had to be specially built in order to fit inside that building. When the truck is inside the building and the garage door is closed, um, you're, there's not enough space to walk between the front of the fire truck and the garage door. So you have to open up the garage door in order to go from the man door on the left hand side and get in the driver's seat to respond. Firefighters will go to headquarters, they'll get their gear, they'll run across the street, and then they'll, uh, they'll respond on that truck to uh, the incidences. So there's a, there is a slight delay in the response. So we'll talk a little bit about our department and what we were to what we are now. 1986, um, very first full-time firefighters, there was only three of them that were hired in 86. Um, a fourth full-time firefighter was hired in uh, 89, I believe. Um, Steve, if you want to you know, nod, nod your head up and down, I believe it was 89 or 88 was our fourth full-time firefighter. Um, the town of Charlton didn't actually get its first full-time fire chief until 1999. Um, since then, we've had one ever since. Um, and today, we have a full-time fire chief and a full-time deputy fire chief. So that's what our current staffing was. So if you think about the building that we talked about already, um, all it really had to hold in 1999 was it was four full-time firefighters plus the fire chief. So five firefighters. The building was adequate at that time. It was a um, primarily a call fire department with a very small contingency of full-time firefighters. Today, much different scenario that we have right now. Um, we have 21 full-time union firefighter EMTs. Out of, out of those 21, 13 of us are paramedics. Like I said, we have a full-time fire chief, full-time deputy fire chief. We have a full-time administrative assistant. We have five call firefighters. Two of them are firefighter EMTs. Um, and we have two EMT only. So that's our current staffing, um, much larger number of um, people um, or much greater um, percentage of people. Our department has transitioned completely into a full-time fire department just because of our call volume and the, uh, the lack of availability of off-duty uh, call personnel during the day, uh, primarily because obviously they work. Um, plus there's a desire to get the, uh, the vehicles out the door a lot faster in order to provide a better service. There's you know, uh, 43 square miles in this town, um, over 300 road miles. It takes us a long time to get going. And we didn't want the delay to be happening uh, anymore while we waited for people to come in from home. So we try to staff the building accordingly in order to get the uh, vehicles out the door as quick as we can. So the current firefighters are broken down into four shifts. Uh, 20 firefighters are broken down into four groups. Captain and four firefighters are assigned to each group. Um, Administration works Monday through Friday, 8A to 4P usually. And then our call firefighters, that was a question that was recently asked on the, one of the forums. Um, when do the call firefighters come in? They work 6P to 6A, they come in from home um, on, on all fire calls. So uh, myself, I'm the captain of group one. So I have one call firefighter assigned to me. And when there's a call between 6P and 6A, a fire uh, emergency, and he'll come in from home and he'll uh, help uh, bring up my staffing one more firefighter. Seville. So brief uh, looking at the last several years as far as call volume back in 2014, not that long ago, only six years ago, we were doing about 1700 or 1800 calls, um, which seemed really busy for us back then. Uh, 2019 last year, um, nearly 2800 calls is what we were uh, what we were up to. So you can just see the steady increase in our call volume for it's, it's a multitude of reasons. But it's uh, following the national trend as far as the increase in calls. That's both police and fire, I mean, uh, fire and EMS related calls. Uh, a recent question that was in the chat was, uh, how does your calls get counted? If you go to a motor vehicle accident and there's 30 patients, is that 30 calls or is that just one call? Uh, here in the Charlton Fire Department, we just count that as one call. We don't care how many patients we have. We don't care how many apparatus go to that call. 
it only counts as one call. Uh, it's, it's different from department to department as far as how they count calls. Um, we are the third busiest fire department in Southern Worcester County, um, just south of Worcester, um, the town of Auburn, um, the town of Selfridge, and then there's us with our staffing of five firefighters uh, on duty. Projected call volume over the next uh, 25 years. This wasn't uh, done by us. This is actually done by Central Mass Regional Planning Commission. Um, they helped us with this um, projection. Um, in 25 years, um, our call volume is going to be you know, nearly 8,000 calls um, per year. This is actually an important number. This is sort of um, what we use to help guide us in the um, projection of our uh, of this building and what we wanted to do. We didn't want to run into a situation where we built this building for a very cheap amount of money. And then within 10, 15 years, we were coming back to uh, the townspeople saying that the building was not uh, large enough um, and uh, we were looking to add another an addition or stuff like that. So um, this has sort of helped us guide us in that direction. Not only did we um, do a lot of calls and as our calls increased over the time period, however, we also gave away a lot of calls, um, asking mutual aid, asking area towns to come in and take care of our Charlton residents. Our, you know, our residents was not something that we wanted to do. Um, we don't like to do that. Our, our taxpayers pay for us and we wanted our taxpayers to get the service from us. So we added staffing um, back in 2016 to bring us up to a, a higher number. And since then, we've actually uh, received mutual aid significantly less. We're down uh, probably under 15 times a year. Mutual aid has to come in and help us. Um, and if you look, we were back in 2014, they had to come in about 115, 118, uh, 115 times a year. We're down to probably about 15 times. So we knocked off about 100 times a year of having to call in another town. And, and which you get the service, however, it's just a delay. Um, and then it's obviously it's lost revenue as well. If every ambulance call we give away, that town that does the transport gets the ambulance revenue, which the town uses to help offset its budget. And then not only do we um, ask for less mutual aid, but we're also providing uh, a fair amount of mutual aid as well to other communities um, when they need help. So here's our current police station. Like I said, uh, interim police chief uh, Dan Dowd is on and uh, the police officer uh, Derek Gaylord. They are both representatives of police department on this committee. Um, they can definitely chime in if there's anything that they want to add to this. But um, this is the police station that was opened up in 1991, 30 years ago. It was built at a time much different than what we are today. Uh, technology really didn't exist in 91. I graduated high school in 1994 and uh, just started using uh, computers back then. So think about what we, what we have today compared to then. This was actually the dispatch center. That's uh, one of the dispatchers. And uh, in that room, it existed one telephone, one typewriter, and one radio. Um, and then they also had a, a brand new state computer that they used to check licenses um, and warrants information. Today, uh, much different than what they have now uh, with the existence of 911 um, and just the increase in call volume, which we've already went over for the fire department. We'll talk about the police department in a minute. In a minute. Um, there was definitely some needs that needed to be done. So this is the current police station. This um, station right here, um, this dispatch center, this is their primary dispatch center. There's a dispatcher sitting there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This is the window that the people come to in the lobby. This is a second workstation that they recently have uh, added and completed, uh, made it a full second workstation. There is a dispatcher there eight hours a day, um, 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday, usually between 11A and 7P, just because of the call volume. It was just too much for one dispatcher to, uh, to handle. 2020, according to the town report that I found online, um, they, the department received 24,000 phone calls. Um, some of them are emergency instances. Some of those phone calls are multiple calls for the same emergency, but um, that's a dispatcher having to answer the telephone 24,000 times um, in 2020. Um, majority of them were actually emergencies, both for the police department and fire department and ambulance. The biggest, um, one of the biggest changes was the change to the 911 system and the fact that our dispatchers handle the 911 um, that are called in by cell phones, where up until recently, those calls were all uh, transferred over to the state police barracks and then they, uh, they handled the, the initial call. That's not the case anymore. So our dispatchers are becoming uh, quite overwhelmed. They're kind of packed in there. Every time someone comes to the lobby, the dispatcher actually has to uh, leave the desk in order to go handle the person at the lobby window. 
and, and that's all fine and dandy as long as there's no calls going on. But in the event that there's a, a major emergency going on with the police department or the fire department, stuff like that, um, it's very difficult for them to leave the desk in order to handle the window, uh, the window person. So here are some of the other um, concerns with the police department. Um, the building does not meet current codes for a multitude of reasons. We can let the architects kind of talk, uh, touch upon that a little bit, but um, this is one of the cells that's out of service. The, uh, the toilet uh, sink thing um, combination broke. It's very difficult to find parts for. 30 year old building, it just takes a lot of money in order to uh, maintain this. They have a, a roof problem. Um, during heavy rains or in the winter time when it snows, um, water builds or snow builds up and it causes leaks in the roof and then that actually starts leaking into the uh, cells. Here's your lockers for um, the top lockers are actually for the dispatchers and the bottom lockers are for the prisoners. And uh, when the prisoners come in and they got to lock up their belongings um, because they can't have certain things inside the cell, they put them in the bottom lockers. And then the top lockers are for the dispatchers when they come in and they want to store their belongings um, while they're there for their shift. So. They have to share um, the locker space with the prisoners. It's just not adequate um, for them. The dispatcher uh, doesn't actually have a built, uh, doesn't actually have a restroom nearby. Um, in the event that they have to use the, the bathroom, they have to wait for an officer to come in from off duty or um, officer to come in from off the road, sorry, and um, relieve them off the desk so that way they can use the bathroom because of the distance that they have to travel to get to the bathroom. Um, in the event that they were in the bathroom and obviously 911 rang, they have to answer that phone within two rings. It's state law, so um, just not adequate for them. Here's their lobby. If you've never been in the police department lobby, um, you should kind of stop in there. They can definitely uh, give you a tour as well of the building. Um, the lobby back then, back 30 years ago when they designed it, was actually very uh, appropriate for them. It was not used as a lobby like it is today. Um, today, the uh, chairs that you see are people waiting to get their uh, license to carry. Another chair could be someone trying to register um, as a sex offender. Um, the next chair down from that is someone looking to dispose of uh, dirty needles and uh, sharps and uh, medications. And then lastly, that fourth chair could be a, uh, a divorced parent with a child and they're looking to do their weekend exchange that takes place at the police station. Um, it's much different uh, use of the lobby than what it is now. It's a much different use of the police station. Um, is what it is now. 30 years ago, you almost never went to the police station. Um, the police officer came to you where more times than not, a lot of people are going to the police station now. So um, it's just not adequate. There's no, there's no restroom as well. Someone comes in to use the bathroom, they actually have to let them into the actual full access police station who's, um, in order to use the bathroom. So it's just not a good situation for them as well. Here's their prisoner processing. They only can process one prisoner at a time under arrest because of the, just the way that the system is set up. There's no way to secure multiple prisoners inside the building um, prior to putting them in the cell. They have to be processed. If they arrest more than one person, the uh, additional people just uh, hang tight in the cruisers inside the garage, on garage doors inside the Bay Area, and they just wait um, in order to, before they can be processed. So that just ties up an officer a little bit longer. Um, that cruiser is tied up. They actually can't go out and handle emergencies while they're waiting to process these uh, prisoners because there's no place to hold them um, before they can put them in the cell room. Back then, 30 years ago, much different. Again, less OUIs um, than what take place today. Just uh, yesterday, one of our officers uh, had two OUI arrests and one eight-hour shift. Um, there was less accidents back then, less drug arrests back then. Um, much, again, much different um, police department as far as their um, responses today than what it was originally. The, the department just didn't, um, the building just wasn't designed for what it is today for the growth that they've had. Um, 1991, when the building opened up, there was a, a police chief, three sergeants and eight patrol officers. So total of 12 police officers and three dispatchers. That's actually what they had. Today on the right-hand side, you can see police chief, a lieutenant, um, four patrol sergeants, a detective sergeant, 14 patrol officers, four full-time dispatchers, anywhere between 16 and 20 auxiliary police officers, including like what they call special police officers, a full-time administrative assistant, a part-time administrative assistant. The department, uh, the building itself just wasn't designed for all of these needed personnel in order to uh, run the department. So again, people talk about, well, the building's only 30 years old. Yes, it is only 30 years old, but if you build your house 30 years ago and you built your house to have three bedrooms and all of a sudden you have nine children, you, your house is, is too small. 
um, and they just kept growing, their, their department kept growing to handle the additional call volume. Um, so here's our, here's our four stations. And this is actually uh, one of the things that people want to know. I just got a, a message yesterday on one of the forums. What happens to these buildings if this building passes? If this new building is built, what happens? Well, I can tell you the, the fire headquarters um, most likely will get um, sold off or um, get repurposed for another town building. But I believe, um, I don't know if Andrew Golis or the Municipal Building Committee has made a decision on this, but um, we would move out of headquarters. Um, most likely the building would get sold off and that money sale of that building would go and help offset the cost of the project. Um, Station two up in North Main Street, that building is most likely going to get demolished. It's, it's, it's on its way anyway. It's not going to take very much longer. Hopefully um, we can get it replaced, but um, that building is just going to get torn down. And I believe that area was just going to get used as a parking lot. That was one of the dis, uh, discussions. Station three, our, our building, our Quonset Hut where the tower truck parks. Um, that is on lease land and part of the lease agreement is the building goes to the property owner that we have the lease land from. So it just goes to them um, and they, uh, they take ownership of it um, and then we're, we're done with it over there. And then lastly is the police station. And, and again, people say the police station isn't that old. Why do we need to replace it? Because the department itself just doesn't fit inside that, inside that building anymore. Um, People have asked, uh, why can't you just put an addition onto the building? Why not put a second floor onto the police station? Why not put an addition out front or out back? That was looked at very briefly as part of our project that we're in right now. And uh, due to the wetlands surrounding the building, there was no way to um, bump out the building. Um, not to mention that bumping out the building actually um, made them lose parking spaces. And parking is at a premium with their, um, with their duty uh, cruisers and their spare cruisers. The public itself only really has two parking spaces um, for them to, uh, for the public to use. So there really was no option to put an addition onto the building. The building was not designed for a second floor. So structurally speaking, um, it would end up with a, a significant amount of uh, renovation in order to make it structurally able to hold the second floor, which just didn't, uh, didn't make any sense. But there's been thoughts about what do we do with this building that is structurally sound. It is correct. Uh, people are are correct in their statement. Structurally sound compared that building compared to all of our fire stations, uh, it is um, structurally sound. So one option is to make it into a senior center. Uh, one option, and, and then the food pantry, which is you know put it across from the Masonic Home and uh, up the street from uh, Meadowview Senior uh, Housing um, Center. There, uh, there's a couple ideas. Um, that's not our committee to decide what that building use is going to be uh, in the event that this building passes in November 3rd and we eventually move into the new building and we'll talk about that timeline as well. Um, that's up to the town, that's up to the Board of Selectmen, that's up to the Municipal Building Committee, um, that probably even be open to the, to the townspeople to say what do we want to do with this town building that is paid for right now. Um, that's another thing people ask is the building's not even paid for. The building has been paid for for um, several years now. So how did we get to here? And this is our, our, our timeline that we're in. Um, again, 30 years ago, the police station was built. 25 years ago, the very first fire station building committee was formed. And there was a proposal for $5 million for a build a, to build a new fire headquarters. And the townspeople voted no, said that it was too much money. Um, I didn't actually put two and two together until someone recently uh, made me aware of it. It was actually just after the middle school was built. So they didn't want to raise their taxes because the middle school was just built. Taxes got raised. And they didn't want to raise their taxes again for the fire station. So they voted no. About 15 years ago, they proposed another building and said $12 million for a new fire station. It got voted down. So between the original station and the second or original proposal, the second proposal, 10 years later, the building costs actually went up um, $7 million. 2005, the Quonset Hut was built. Um, we end up with all of this stuff that we talked about. So 2017, they actually reformed the fire station. There's been a lot of fire station committees that have come and gone between uh, 1994 and 2017. Every committee has paid, the townspeople have paid money for consultants to analyze the fire department and the needs of the fire department and whether or not we can just do an addition and stuff. And every team that has been brought in, every consultant has been brought in, they've all come up with the same conclusion is that you need to build a, a new fire headquarters to 
consolidate all of your equipment in one building. So 2016, 2017, we formed this new committee. Um, originally it becomes the fire station um, committee and then it gets turned into a public safety building committee just due to the needs of the, uh, the police station as well. Um, we went to the townspeople for money to hire um, Tecton Architect and Vertex Engineering and to purchase the land. We looked at six sites, six different sites that we looked at um, before we ended up deciding on the site that we had. And uh, we went to the townspeople in 2018, asked for money to purchase the land. $658,000, I believe was the article at the May 2019 meeting, uh, 2018 meeting, 658,000, purchased the land, um, hired the architect and hire Vertex Engineering. Um, they all came in and then we started working on the design of the building. Prior to that, prior to 2018, um, when the committee formed, there was actually a consultant coming, um, brought in by the name of Weston and Sampson and they came in to help us with our space needs analysis. They did an analysis of the police station, fire station, and they helped us figure out how big of a building we needed in order to do our current needs as well as our projected growth needs and allowed us to figure out what size land we needed to purchase. So we didn't wanna buy a three acre parcel of land and, and we ended up needing about four and a half acres. So um, they came in, they did their space needs analysis and they, and they told us what we needed. Then we hired Tecton and Vertex Engineering 2018. May 2019 is the spring town meeting, annual town meeting. Uh, we're gonna get into the discussion in a little bit, I'm sure of the differences that take place at the town meetings versus the ballot, um, ballot box, the ballot vote. Town meeting is where projects are decided um, to move forward or to not. Um, May town meeting, um, the project gets approved to construct a $28.5 million public safety building. That $28.5 million was a guess. It was, it, was a, it was a very good guess. It was a very solid guess. It was an estimate that was done by uh, Tecton Architects through their estimating company. We didn't actually have our full plan, so it was a guess. So that's how that number came up and that vote passed, which then requires, because that um, there wasn't enough money in the, debt uh, in the levy limit to do that building without raising the taxes, it requires us to go to the town um, ballot to uh, pass at a town ballot vote. August ballot vote happens and that vote fails. Because of the way the article was written in 2019 in May, it allowed us to come back to the taxpayers um, with another article, with another ballot vote. It did not require another town meeting, it just required another ballot vote. So um, that's where we're at right now as far as uh, November 3rd is our ballot vote. So I know that was a lot of information as far as their fire station, police station, current needs and stuff. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna bring on Rebecca Hopkins and uh, Jeff um, McElravey. They are, the, like I said, the architects from Tecton. They're gonna talk to you guys about how they came about this building, this design, this situation, um, how it's situated on the, on the road, um, why it is what it is, um, why, um, we looked at a, a prefabricated building, why that wasn't a really a feasible option. Um, so they'll come in and they're actually gonna start uh, talking about this current project. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk some of them. Rob, are you gonna continue to share or would you like me to share? Um, no, yeah, I can, I can share. I just don't have that site plan, so. Um, oh, okay. Um, I, can, I can share though. I can share, let me share, because I think okay. the plan will be more informative. Go ahead. As long as I have the rights. Do I have to stop sharing? Yes. Okay, stop sharing, right? You do it, Rebecca? Oh, I'm still seeing your content. Um, no, you, Rob. Resume share. Oh, it's done. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Can you can you take it? What was that, Rob? There you go. You're all set. Okay. 
Perfect. So um, again, I'm Rebecca Hopkins, Tecton Architects. Um, with me is Jeff McRavey. Um, so we are a part of a very large team of, of designers, architects, and engineers. Um, it is not just us. Um, we have mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire, um, protection, civil structure, et cetera, um, as a part of our team. Um, this kind of gives a breakdown of the entire collaborative group. Um, we had a lot of stakeholders and major participants that have taken part in this process. Um, so this gives you a comprehensive list of, of all of those players. I'm going to keep um, the general overview of the project pretty high level because I do think we're going to get into a lot of the details um, when it comes to question and answers. Um, but I know folks do have the ability to raise their hand um, and Steve or Rob, if at any point you would like me to stop and pause and address something in more detail, please let me know. Um, so this just gives you guys a feel of where the site is on Masonic Home Road in context across the street from the Overlook, um, just around the corner. Um, down Masonic Home Road from Town Hall. Very um, extensive, comprehensive site analysis was done as a part of this process. Um, wetland delineation, land surveying, uh, traffic analysis, phase one, phase two environmental. We did um, two different rounds of technical investigations, which inclu included borings um, and also uh, rock um, surface mapping to ensure we understood um, what was occurring underneath the potential or proposed building location. Um, we also, and we have full um, engineering services as a part of this team. Um, so although um, prior to Springtown meeting, um, we had prepared design narratives, they have been um, fully involved in all of this analysis. Um, and then also proceeded to include, they were included in the production of the bid documents. Multiple cost estimates were prepared at every phase of the project. Rob mentioned we had prepared a schematic design estimate for that meeting. Um, we have since then prepared a design development estimate and a 50% construction estimate and the closest to a 95% construction estimate um, with bids pending um, this week. So moving a little bit, zooming in a little bit to the site. So again, right on Masonic Home Road, adjacent to the existing police station. Um, if folks can see my cursor, this is the existing police station here. And this is the overlook just across the street. The driveway you see here is their secondary entrance to the overlook. The primary entrance is just off your screen to the south, um, just on the other side of the police station driveway. Our proposed main entrance comes across um, generally across from the second overlook entrance. Um, there will be a sidewalk provided there to connect to the extended sidewalk um, that runs along Masonic Home Road. This sidewalk also continues all the way down to the front entrance of the building. Um, this is your main entrance and exit. As you come into the facility, um, you kind of come up to this general parking area in front to the left and to the right. That is intended to support all public parking. Um, and they are large enough to support the community training room, community meeting room that is within the building um, that has an occupancy of 40 people. Um, one thing you will notice is that the driveways are all sized in order to accommodate an apparatus um, in their response. Um, but there's also a secondary driveway that is provided. This is in case of an emergency, if uh, an incident did occur um, in front of the main entrance that emergency person site. Um, this can also be used by um, the police officers and cruisers in response, um, but it is an exit only driveway located here. You'll notice that the main entrance is in this area right here of the site. You have your main police portion of the building. A lot of the shared public amenities are right at the corner of the L-shaped building. Around the back, you'll notice that there are some designated parking spaces those will be in support of the police officer's personal vehicles, as well as the cruiser parking, which is provided for right here in the back, which is also covered to protect them from inclement weather. There is a sally port here to drive through and some additional spaces to support personal vehicles. Again, on the back side, you kind of come behind the fire, which more the fire portion of the building. These are the main apparatus bays. These are in drive through orientation um, with um, aprons on the front and the back. You've got additional parking. And then Rob did mention those special response trailers. Um, there are five spaces here that will protect those trailers as well in support of the fire department. Out front, you have some spaces um, right along that apron of the apparatus bay. Um, those will support the fire department. 
personnel and administration. That kind of gives you a general orientation of the site. Um, as Rob mentioned, in this area, there are a substantial amount of wetlands and they kind of coat the outside of the entire property. Um, so one thing that was important to us is not only balancing the site, um, there is some grade changes there. Um, as you drive along the Sonic Home Road, it kind of dips down. Um, so looking to balance the site, but also being conscious of the wetlands and the existing rock that does exist deeper down below the surface. So moving into the building, um, and again, please stop me if there's any questions, um, but this would be the front door here. You'd come into the main lobby. This is a shared lobby. There are two secure points of entry into the police portion of the building and to the fire portion of the building. So security was something that we did consider and talk extensively with the committee and departments. Um, you have your main dispatch area right in front of you as you come in. Um, this dispatch center support has all the needs that would support them um, if they needed to use the facility. There's a toilet. Um, their lockers are right there, small kitchenette, so that if a call comes in, they can easily respond to the console. It also has point contact in the main lobby. Adjacent to that, you have records. You have two, you have one public interview slash triage space that is to support a lot of the new functions that Rob touched on, such as child exchange, permits, et cetera. Um, it is much better suited. Um, it also is capable of handling an emergency if someone were to walk in um, and need medical assistance. Just off to just off of that lobby, we kind of enter into the police portion of the building, um, more police dedicated spaces. There's a second interview room there, which would probably be used for more of that permitting, um, as well as you've got a court prosecutor and some central copy areas in that main area. As you come down the hallway, you have your main patrol areas, report sergeants, um, and then further down on the right, you have your prisoner processing area and evidence areas. So the evidence processing includes your lab, leaving, storage, et cetera, and that is immediately adjacent to the prisoner processing area, which includes detention. So there are cells in that area. That's also your booking area, and that is directly connected to the Sally port. If you extend into the fire portion, so I'm gonna come back to the lobby to go down on the right here, you have most fire administration offices. So you have your fire inspector, your fire chief, all along this front here, you've got some building support spaces. So your comm equipment, mechanical, electrical, they're all located in this area, close to dispatch, but in the core of the building, conference room, et cetera. As you extend down that hallway, you've got some locker rooms to support the fire department. Rob talked about the limited amount of showers when they come back from a call. Um, and then you enter into the apparatus bay itself. So you've got six bays um, there divided by some support spaces. So some of those support spaces include EMS storage, um, we've got decon facilities, we've got turnout gear facilities, um, and a training tower. So that training tower looks to um, optimize the height that is created within that apparatus bay to provide for training facilities within the building um, and give them those opportunities within the facility itself. So this just kind of gives you a quick designation of those different areas of the building. On the second floor, so when you come up this main public stair, that will be the main way a visitor would come up the building. You have the main community training room. This is intended to be an EOC. It's intended for fire matic and police training, and it's also intended for community use. Um, it has, it is flexible. It can be um, set up in many different ways, um, and it supports um, a lot of those different functions, not only that the department needs, but that the community was looking for as well. That is supported by multiple bathroom facilities, um, an elevator and some storage space. So it's pretty simple space when you come up onto that second floor, but it's really intended to be an extension of that public lobby. Again, there are secure points into the fire police portions of the building. So going into the police portion of the building, we have some records archives, general storage um, that is really needed. Um, it's currently, I think, in the basement of the police facility, is not organized. Um, so this really gives them a one, one space to really consolidate um, and better organize all of that, that archive that needs to be kept. You've got the police administration on the second floor. So that includes your fire chief, your police chief's office, your conference room, et cetera, um, with the admin right off of that that hallway. So if someone were to come up and visit police administration, you would come right up and see that right off of that public lobby. You have a shared fitness and tactical training space. So this space right here that's wide open is shared by both police and fire. 
So from the police side, it is accessed here and through the fire side is actually accessed through the back. This is really important because if a fire, for example, um, typically if a firefighter is working out during shift, he has to be able to respond quickly and be able to get to the apparatus immediately. Um, the response is slightly different for police and fire. Police are typically responding from the road, fire are typically responding from the station. So it's really important that we ensured that that functionality worked, that we could find a shared location where we could optimize the shared use of the facility, but also not um, provide any response issues. As you continue down that hallway, you have your investigative area with your detectives bureau um, interview room. You have some small support spaces off of that hallway, armory, um, weapons cleaning, et cetera. In the far right back corner, you have the main male and female locker rooms to support the police staff, as well as a combination break roll call room. Entering into onto the fire side, as you come down the hall, and on the right in the front of the building are all of the bunk rooms. On the left, you'll notice there are some small shared unisex toilets and showers which support those living facilities. As you kind of come around those through to the back of the fire portion of the building, you'll notice it's a wide, pretty wide open space which is essentially used for kitchen, dining, and day room. Those are their main spaces um, that they'll be using when they're on staff at the station. Again, we're looking at the upper level of the apparatus bay there. I mentioned earlier that there is a lot of height in there. We always look to optimize that height. Um, we don't need, we need the height for the apparatus, but we don't necessarily need the height um, for those support spaces. So on top of those support spaces, like the turnout gear room, for example, um, we provide a training mezzanine. So through the training tower, we give access to that mezzanine and it's open to the bays and it allows them to perform different training operations within the facility. Um, this, is, this is really a great option because um, they can, whether the, whatever the weather is, they can practice um, and train right there um, with their own equipment. Um, so we look to give them certain confined space training over hallways, um, different rappel and ladder opportunities, et cetera. There are some other support spaces off of these mezzanines. Um, you'll see one's bulk storage that's for spare gear, et cetera. Um, so we also use that um, as well. And again, this is a slight breakdown of the different areas. So Rob mentioned earlier that this was a um, exterior perspective of the building. Um, so just to orient um, based on the floor plan that we were just talking about, this was the main entrance. This is that community training room. This would be more of the police portion of the building. So you had that, um, you had some of the uh, patrol facilities down here, administration up here. This was that main public stair tower that you would be going up and down to get to this community training room. And then this would be the firehouse. These were the administrative offices for fire and the bunk rooms for fire. And then this was the apparatus bay. Rob, do you want me to continue into? Uh, no, I just, uh, I have it right here. Okay. All right, um, can you guys see this now? My screen, the projected cost. Okay. So uh, Andrew Golis is on as well as uh, Donna Foglio, our finance director, in case anybody has any questions, you know, with the, with the costs. So um, like we said earlier, um, the projected cost was $28.5 million. The total debt exclusion to the taxpayer right now sits at $26.8 million due to the fundraising committee, which um, they're going to give a little um, update on their um, process as well in a minute. So this is the breakdown um, that takes place. The average homeowner, uh, these numbers are actually uh, less now. It's only because of that 3.25% uh, initial interest rate, and we've actually uh, changed the interest rate a little bit. So um, the numbers here on the screen are not accurate, you know, not technically accurate or, or maybe in averages. If you go on charltonpublicsafetybuilding.com and under the financial section, you can type in your um, property value based off of the town assessor's website, and they will tell you what your increase is going to be. 
and they will give you your yourself specific to what your increase is going to be for the total for the year and then total for um, every month. The average homeowner has a home value. The average home value in the town of Charlton is $281,800. So that equates to be the average homeowner's tax bill will increase $225 or a little bit more than $50 per quarter um, is what it will end up coming off to be. In FY 2025, the town of Charlton, will, um, that's our last debt exclusion, um, barring any new debt exclusion that is added to the, to the town. But that's our last debt exclusion. Um, and 14 cents is gonna roll off of our tax rate um, then that is on there now for the highway facility. Um, the first increase to the taxpayer, um, even if this building passes in November, the first increase will ha not happen until your bill in February of 2023. Your first increase that will happen. So the building construction, if it passes in November, construction sort of starts right away. The ground uh, gets broken in March of 2021 with a completion of about March or April uh, 2022. And then your first increase to your tax bill would be about a year later in February of 2023. If you guys have any specific questions about the financials once we finish, then uh, Again, we have Donna is on as well as Andrew Golis to talk about this. There is uh, initially the 30 year loan and there's a possibility of a 40 year loan. Um, either one of them can uh, chime in on sort of that process. So that's it for this um, presentation. We're gonna get into our question and answer portion. There's a, a number of questions that we seem to keep getting on social media and we can try to start addressing some of those questions. But um, Donna or Andrew, Either one of you guys want to talk about the financials and the, the loan that we're potentially getting and, and how that's going to work out? Yeah, Rob, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll add, I think that these, uh, the numbers that were on here might have been from the, um, the, the, the debt exclusion um, that was considered at the last time. Um, but the one that, uh, the projection that we're bringing forward now is actually a level, um, you know, a, a level rate service which will go over the full 30-year term so really what you see around year 15 and fy uh, 35 it would be consistent payments uh, around that mark for the full uh, term of the project versus uh, diminishing um, dimi uh, the diminishing payments over the term okay. so that's the difference um, and again there was two different options they could either Pay higher at the beginning and then lower at the end, or they can just average out the payment uh, the same amount, kind of like how you do your home mortgage. So uh, like we just heard from Andrew, it sounds like we're going to go with this uh, consistent payment. So the average, it's actually 86 cents per thousand. Uh, that says 91. And then just so you guys know, when you guys do your charltonpubliccafetybuilding.com and you click on the financials and you get what your, your property value is, um, is, if you're not sure what your property value is, you can. Uh, there is a link that brings you right to Patriot Properties. You can find what the town um, taxes you at. Uh, that number is based off of a 30-year loan. So there's a potential that we get a 40-year loan, which then lowers the dollar amount. So uh, that is sort of what we call the worst case scenario is the 30-year loan. And then the 40-year loan is a little bit less money. Obviously, we just spread it out over an additional 10 years. So... Um, that's it for our presentation, and then we'll get into question and answers, so we can kind of turn it back over. Actually, Steve, I don't know if you guys want to do your fundraising now, and then we can get into all the questions. Or uh, Noreen, so Noreen's going to handle the fundraising part of it. Yes, Noreen, if you could, Noreen, if you could uh, do a quick overview of the uh, Capital Campaign Committee? Sure, happy to. Um, and I don't have a screen to share, so I don't know if you want to put it back on any one of those other pictures, um, but people can uh, certainly continue to submit questions. So we had, um, after the vote last August, um, decided uh, a group of citizens who um, were concerned about the cost 
uh, got together to volunteer to try to raise money to offset the total cost to the taxpayers. So as you saw on that last slide, it looks like 26.8 million um, it, pending the, the bids being opened uh, next week. But um, about 26.8 million that would have to be financed through uh, taxes. And in the spirit of trying to be a little more creative and think about the ways that we might be able to reduce the tax burden, particularly for um, seniors on a fixed income and people that you know may be struggling, uh, we set about to try to raise money. So we have been working really hard and I am really pleased that uh, several other volunteer members of the committee are also on this call. Um, Lois Chagru, Monique Lemire, Karen Spiewak, um, Steve, myself, um, Allie Jenkins have all been uh, kind of beating the pavement in Charlton and getting out and talking to local business owners, uh, looking for their support, uh, doing presentations up at the Overlook, uh, going around to all of the storefronts in Charlton and soliciting support. So as of uh, today, and we're still waiting for a number of responses and there's still other places we still have to follow up on, but as of today, um, we have raised uh, a total in hand of $367,175 and um, a lot more pending as well. I happen to know of several gifts that are on their way in. So um, we have a lot of interest in this, a lot of support from local businesses. And um, it doesn't just have to be funded through local businesses. Uh, banks from the region have been contributing. And I, I did wanna just note one of the questions that I saw go by in the chat pertain to um, other communities and how they support us if we're part of a regional response. Um, certainly regional response goes back and forth. We help them, they help us, but the banks and the companies outside of Charlton recognize that we're part of that regional response. And so we've had several large contributions come from um, Dexter Russell and the Hyde Foundation, several of the banks um, that are based in Southbridge and some of which have branches in Charlton um, are also contributing to the project and several other banks are working on their contributions right now. Um, so more, more donations are coming in. Um, so there, there is a recognition about the role that our police and fire play in a regional emergency response. Um, there are gifts posted on the town's website. So when you go, there are two websites. You can go through the town of Charlton and on the front page of the website, there's like a red and blue icon in the corner to donate to the public safety building capital campaign. Um, when you click on that, it opens up another page and on the side uh, navigation bar, you can click on donors and see who has donated to the campaign so far. Um, and then we continue to update that every week as gifts come in. Um, you can for larger gifts for those who might be on the call who have uh, the ability, please feel free to join us. Um, please help us fundraise. Uh, it's not just big donors, it's little donors like me and little donors like uh, all the members on our committee who have made gifts uh, that together, I think it helps tremendously to offset uh, the cost for the residents. Um, so please feel free to make a donation and you have the opportunity to thank your favorite firefighter or thank your favorite police officer or thank the ambulance person that helped you uh, last year, in any of these cases, it's an opportunity to say thank you and give back. Um, there are uh, opportunities maybe for employer matched donations. And if you work for a larger company, you can ask about that and see if they have a program and we would be happy to follow up and help um, in any way we can to make that easier. Um, we also are hoping that um, some of the local businesses will participate in a roundup program where you can add on you know, the change from your purchase and have that change be contributed to the campaign. Um, but there's lots of ways to get involved and to be helpful. I know um, 
you can share information from the second website, which is www.charltonpubliccafetybuilding.com. Not very creative name, but charltonpubliccafetybuilding.com. And when you go on there, all the information for the project is in one place. So a lot of what you've heard tonight um, and a lot of the uh, questions that Rob has been very busy answering online, um, the answers are also at the website. So you can take a look and, and learn a little more. Um, and I do wanna welcome anyone who would like to help us. I mean, we're just uh, Charlton citizens. We're interested in having a good public safety response in our town. Uh, we share your interest in having the town look nice. Um, we've heard complaints online about why doesn't the town invest in things? Well, this is part of it. This is one way in which we're investing in getting rid of that fire station on North Main Street um, and that really needs to go and making our community uh, look like a town that cares about itself, which I know we all do. Um, and I also just want to say, you know, if anyone is uh, concerned about uh, the tax increase and their ability to pay it, we do have an abatement program um, through the selectman's office or the town manager. I'm sure Andrew Golas can uh, respond to that for our seniors on a fixed income who are having difficulty paying taxes. And the town has had that program um, already. And then if you want to make a donation to help a neighbor who maybe can't um, afford a tax increase and provide a gift to help support your neighbors. We would be happy to um, help that happen as well. So um, thanks very much. And uh, I will also add, you know, I originally was very worried about the cost of this project. And, um, you know, I, I, I had only driven by the police station. Thankfully, I don't have the experience inside the cells. And uh, having a closer look at uh, police operations. But um, when I did take a tour, I, I have to say, originally I thought the building, gee, it looks so nice. Why do we need a new one? But when you go inside and you look at how they're operating, it really um, was not built for a police station in today's standards um, with computer equipment and wiring, server rooms, all of the technology that's involved in law enforcement today was not around in the early 1990s. And um, the space is clogged and it really is not safe uh, for both uh, some of the prisoners as well as the staff. So I'm happy to support the project. I'm happy to have learned a lot more about it. And I really appreciate all the time and energy that the building committee and the volunteers from town who've worked on that building committee have put into this. So thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, I just want to follow up on uh, two points. Uh, it is a question that our committee has been asked. That question is, what happens to the money in the event that uh, And the answer to that question is. So Steve, I think you're going in and out a little only bit. Only 100. Steve, you're, uh, you're breaking up. Um, Steve, your, your audio is breaking up, but I think I know the question you're asking. Um, so if you can hear me, can someone nod so I know my audio is okay? All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, Steve, you've been in and out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond. So, can you hear me? Yep, now I can. Oh, there you are, Steve. Oh, yeah, you're on frozen now. You were frozen before. You want to okay. try again? Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to address uh, two questions um, that has come to our committee uh, in the past. And one is, what happens uh, to the donations in the event that this uh, does not pass at the polls in November? And the answer to that question is 100% of any donations that have been collected to this point or any donations in the future 100% of it is being used as a direct offset to the cost of this project. In the event that this question does not pass at the ballot in November, that money will be kept uh, in an account and it will be used to offset any future building project uh, that the town chooses uh, to take on in the future. So, um, 
And again, if there's any follow-ups to that, don't hesitate to reach out to any of the committee members. And then one last point, um, uh, just regarding the capital campaign is that uh, providing that this question passes at the polls in November, uh, our committee does not stop working uh, the first week in November just because it passed. Uh, Mrs. Foglio can, can speak uh, more eloquently than I can on this in terms of when exactly the borrowing will take place. But again, uh, if, it's, if, the, if the project passes, the town is not going out and borrowing money the following week in order to construct the project. So the money will be borrowed over a period of time. So our committee will continue to work um, you know, probably well for another year uh, trying to collect money. And ultimately that still reduces the amount of borrowing that we'll have to do. So the fact that the town will not have to go out and borrow the money immediately still gives, gives the capital campaign committee the opportunity to raise funds, which ultimately continues to lower that borrowing amount down, which will still be an offset to the taxpayers. Uh, so I, I just wanted to make that point uh, clear. If I can just add to that, Steve, that, um, you know, there are foundations and grant opportunities, not a lot for public projects like this, because they do expect that the citizens support these types of projects. But there are grant opportunities that only come around once a year. And so we will continue to also apply for grants as they come up in the coming year. Very good. Uh, Rob, if, uh, if you think we're all set to move into the question and answers, uh, we can do that. Yep, that's, uh, that's fine. That's, I don't have anything else. I don't know if anybody else from the committee would like to uh, chime in and add anything before we get into the question and answer. Um, if you do, you're definitely welcome to unmute yourself and, uh, and speak. Sure. I'll, um, let me just ask Andrew if you have any question in Facebook, if you could just copy and paste that into uh, the Zoom, that would be great. Um, at this time, I'll ask any of the panelists if they have anything to say before we open it up uh, to Q and A. If so, uh, just un unmute yourself. All right. Not seeing any. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, Rob, is I'm going to read the questions that I've received in the Zoom first. And then if, when we run out of questions there, I want to circle back and go to the frequently asked questions that we've put together based on social media over the last 30 days uh, to ensure that we've answered those all as well. So the first question uh, is, how did the committee arrive at 28.5 million. And how does that compare to Sutton, which recently built a public safety building? Um, well, I, I'll take part of that. And then we'll actually, I believe we have uh, Vertex Engineering and, uh, and Tecton, they both can chime in. Sutton did not build a public safety building. Sutton built a police station only building. Um, this was recently asked on, the, uh, on one of the forums. Sun built a police station for $8.9 million um, originally. And then I believe they had to go back to the taxpayers for uh, some additional amount of money because they had come up a little bit short. So it was more than the $8.9 million. And their police officer, they have a, a smaller number of police officers than what we currently have. They do a less number of calls and stuff. So they're not a total comparable department to us, but um, again, they only built a police station I think if Vertex or Tecton want to come on, I, I think the total cost was around $10 million. Correct. Yeah, can you hear me? I'm a little far, far from the microphone. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, Sutton added um, also a big component of emergency communications equipment into that project late in the game. So that escalated their number up to the $10 million range. Um, it is also, uh, well, it's, it's four years behind or in front of the estimated uh, project for, for the town of Charlton. And the, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has seen some pretty good escalation in construction costs over that time. Um, relatively, if we look at the, the escalation cost tracking um, from some of the major construction managers in the state, we're very comparable on a footage cost 
if we escalate it to today's dollars. Um, but obviously the scale of the project is, is much larger since it's both police and fire. Um, and we're, we're four years later in the process. So that adds cost. Very good. Uh, hang on one second. So the next question The next question uh, would be for the police chief. And it was, how many persons are on duty in the police building at one time? Well, St Danny Dowd, Steve, uh, that varies due to the shifts. You know, obviously the day shift is more people on three to 11 or 11 to seven, the overnight shift. There's you know, normally three to four officers that including the dispatcher for a total of three to four. That varies when people take sick time or vacation time. That number fluctuates down. It never goes above that. During the day, obviously, there's a school resource officer, a court officer, a traffic officer, and a, the administration, administrative assistant. So our numbers are higher during the day because of some of those services we provide. Again, somebody's at the school, somebody's at the court, there's a detective. So those numbers are, there's more on the day shift, but normally three to four on evenings and nights with uh, including dispatches. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mrs. Foglio, this next question is for you and I'll just let the attendees, uh, both the panelists and the attendees know is that during the presentation, there were some fairly simple questions that came in uh, that I was able to answer. If you wanted to go to the Q&A section, uh, you will be able to see those questions and my responses that I provided. Uh, but there was a follow-up question to one of them, Mrs. Foglio, which I would like you to handle. And the question originated uh, regarding whether or not the Department of Education funded or provided money for the safe education that we do in the schools. And the answer to that question that I provided was that since 1994, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has had uh, what's called a safe grant that is provided to the municipalities. And that grant through the state is supported through the cigarette tax in the state. So the question uh, from the participant was, is the state cigarette tax part of the budget line items? So Mrs. Foglia, if you could just explain how our grants are tracked as it relates to the budget. Um, so the grants are separate. They're not part of the operating budget. They would come in and they'd be in a separate um, fund, and then they would be expended out of that fund based on the requirements of the grant, what they could be spent on. I believe there's also a senior safe as well as a regular safe. Thank senior you, Mrs. Foglitz. Senior being older, not, not senior in high school. Yep. Thank you, Mrs. Foglio. The next question is, are we going to see the building estimate line item breakdown? Cost per square foot for structural, finishes, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, fire protection, landscape, et cetera. Uh, Rebecca? <laughs> we have provided that information to the building committee. Um, Mr. Barton, is that available on your website? Um, is that the 900 page document that we're talking about? Was that, would that be that one? Yes. <laughs> yes, we, we do have a, I believe it's 983 page document um, that we can, uh, we can make available. It's not broken down as easily as uh, everybody thinks it is. Um, I've learned this through this process of trying to uh, find a, a particular item, but um, anything that people want, yes, we, we can definitely um, post that on the uh, Charlton Public Safety page as a link, and people can uh, download it in themselves and, and review a uh, line by line um, entire document. Absolutely. Rob, I, I trust you're being facetious about the 983. The <laughs> estimate is not that long. <laughs> I understand. And to clarify, that document does break down all of the hard costs associated with construction. Um, but that um, does not include um, the total project cost. Um, that estimate includes additional soft costs, including fit furniture, um, equipment, um, other miscellaneous materials testing costs, et cetera. So your total project cost is one number. 
that line by line breakdown is specifically just the hard costs that go into that number associated just with the construction of the building. Very good. And Mr. Barton, where would that document be available? Uh, is that something that would be able to be put on the town website after the bids were opened? Or where do you envision uh, the library, the town hall? Where would you envision that document being available? Um, we can we can make it available right on the on the website, charltonpublicsafetybuilding.com under resources. They'll, they'll be able to click on the link and, and they'll be able to download it themselves onto their own computer and, and review it themselves. Um, it'll just be one of the uh, documents on that link. Very good. Uh, this next question, uh, I'm assuming uh, Rebecca uh, and Jeff will take, because uh, it relates to the programming of the building. So the question is, with the increase in police personnel since the police station was built 30 years ago, how did you determine how much space was needed in the future for both the police and fire personnel? So when we go through the programming exercise, this is a, you know, a lengthy process of conversations with both the police department and the fire department. We talked to a lot of different personnel. We also collect a fair amount of data, uh, looking at calls for service, some of which you've seen in the presentation earlier. Um, looking at town growth, we, we make sure that we tap outside resources um, for what anticipated build out of communities are. And we look at the change in officer per thousand ratio per population. We look at the the change in officers related to calls for service. Um, and then we also look at the change in, in programmatic goals of the police department itself. Um, I think I'm gonna start with the police side really quickly. It's important to note that much of the square footage that goes into a police station isn't necessarily there so that officers can have a desk. Um, there's a little bit of that, but a lot of it has to do with all of the activities that the police department does. For instance, evidence storage. Everybody knows in your house you don't have enough storage, right? Well, evidence storage takes up a lot of space and it's one of those things where uh, the department may be required to store some materials for ex very extensive periods of time. The same is true of record storage. Some of that can be stored electronically, but there's an awful lot of hard copy papers that must be stored. So most of the police departments that I've worked on over the last 30 years have tremendous storage. The training component, we've heard a lot about um, training in recent dialogue nationwide about the need to have appropriate training space. And so that training room is a big component of that, uh, making sure that you have adequate locker spaces for most officers, the space that they get within the police station is their locker where they store all of their gear, all of their clothing, um, where they have to put their um, bulletproof vest in in the evening and hope that it's dry by morning or by the next shift. Um, there's also a little bit of fitness space in there. Um, and then of course the prisoner processing and handling areas are a big component of that. And the final aspect that really drives that is the dispatch center. Um, there's been a number of questions that I've seen uh, just glancing at uh, some of the questions, um, but making sure the dispatch center, sort of that technology core, there's been a lot of conversation about the technology change in the police department over time. That technology core, you need to get right at the very beginning so that this building can last 50, 60 years into the future. And so we have extra capacity in that, that dispatch center so that you can continue to grow and we have the capacity to bring in new technology as well as the back of house capacity to store that technology. So that's the police side. The fire side uh, is the same thing. You look at the calls for service, you look at the growth, you talk a lot about um, how the staffing is gonna work over time to make sure that we look at the, the, the staffing per shift. Um, you get driven a little bit by the, the dormitory space, which is, you know, I gotta tell you, they're fairly modest uh, uh, bedrooms uh, for firefighters. Uh, a little bit of day room space, living space in the facility, plus their offices. Um, there is an awful lot of equipment space. Equipment space drives the day. When you look at those apparatus space at the current fire headquarters or at station two or the Quonset hut over there at station three, there's so much different than what modern day police facility, or excuse me, fire facilities um, provide to make sure that you have the capability to respond. Just thinking about when you open the doors on the side of the fire truck, can you, can you open doors on two trucks at the same time without getting pinched in between. Um, that's really important stuff because there's a lot of operations that go on. And sometimes the call comes when you've got the doors open and you've got to have the space to maneuver and get ready to roll. Um, and then also making sure that you have the ability to accommodate future growth. I believe we talked about um, also how the engine truck was designed to fit the bay. 
instead of the bay designed to fit the engine truck. That costs extra money when you have to do that. So, you know, we use uh, some really great standards. If you drive by on the highway, you'll see all the signs overhead that say uh, overhead, overpass 13 foot nine. Our overhead doors are 14 feet because we know if trucks can get down highway overpasses, they can get into our apparatus space and you don't have to redesign your truck because of that. Um, there's also width and space requirements that go into that. And there's also the capacity for future equipment. Um, you know, you've seen all of the trucks, you've seen all of the ambulances, you've seen the five trailers, making sure that as equipment changes and as the department grows over time, that you still have the capacity to store that within the apparatus space. So I was a long-winded question or answer to that question, but uh, there's a lot of factors that go into looking forward to that future capacity with the goal that you're not coming back in 10, 15, 20 years, that you get some real life out of this building. So uh, Jeff and Re Jeff and, Re and Rebecca and, and Rob, uh, just sort of going on that same plane, uh, one of the questions that came in uh, said, most estimates have a summary page showing the cost per square foot. We need to see what can possibly be cut if needed. So can you address that? Yeah, um, I, I have that page and, and I will and I will post it on the Charlton Public Safety Building.com website on the Charlton Public Safety Building Facebook page. Um, it's only a, a, like a four page document. It has the hard costs and soft costs broken down. Um, we do have some line items in there, some provisions that um, we have prepared to as part of, as part of the bidding process to uh, take out of the bid as um, the bids start coming in in the event that the bids are too high we can take some things out um, in order to have the project itself go through so I will um, I will post that I will um, again we'll, I'll sit down with Andrew and uh, Rebecca and the chief and uh, whatever documents that we have that people may find interesting we'll, uh, we'll post them all it's, we, we have we have everything it's just we haven't received any requests for information um, in the past. It's just all part of our regular uh, monthly minutes. Very good. Uh, this question, this question was already answered by Jeff uh, regarding the Sutton Police Station, but I, I would like it reiterated uh, because this again is one of the most popular questions that's been asked of late. It says we've been told by Rob on Facebook that the project will never exceed the amount the May 2019 town meeting authorized as being a total project cost of 28.5 million. If the Sutton police station final cost was more than projected and it is common for projects to cost more than projected, how do we know that this cost will never be more than projected? Um. Steve, uh, I'll, I'll start the answer and they're logging back on. Uh, actually, no, there's Jeff. Perfect. Jeff, did you hear the question? I think I heard about uh, guaranteeing that the cost would not exceed the amount that's appropriated, something to that effect. Yeah, Jeff. So one of the questions that has come up multiple times by several citizens is the bid amount. So uh, the contractor comes in and bids the project for $22 million. And then we add in our soft costs and 23, whatever that number is, as they start to sort of look for the material that they need to construct the building and they're having trouble finding the material or the cost of the material has gone up since they submitted their bids. Is the, is that bid amount uh, increased? Is that money placed on the taxpayers? is part one of the question. And then part two, kind of like going along with what Sutton did, they had to go back um, for additional amount of money. Um, I can answer that part portion for you, Steve. They actually had to go back to the townspeople for that additional amount of money. They just didn't overspend their budget and then just um, force it on the townspeople. They actually had to go back to the townspeople for another vote for that additional one point something million dollars. But so Jeff, uh, if the bid comes in at $24 million, is the contractor held to that $24 million number? So change orders are a reality in all construction. However, there are a lot of limitations on um, municipal construction in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The contractual obligations in the bidding process are, they're, they're, they're quite substantive. Um, so if, if, for instance, a contractor puts in a bid um, and uh, on say mechanical equipment 
And uh, over the year that of the construction time, there's an increase in, in mechanical equipment costs. The contractor is not eligible to recoup that cost. They have to anticipate that at the time of the bidding. The only time that they would be eligible for some additional cost relative to that is if there was some force majeure issue that came into play, some act of God that nobody could have foreseen. COVID has done that recently, although we haven't seen anywhere any substantial costs as a result of that. We've seen a little bit of additional um, time costs and some costs for dealing with proper hygiene on the site on some projects, but in general, we haven't seen any big costs. So the kinds of things that will come up during construction, if there are any, any unforeseen conditions, there's been a tremendous amount of site investigatory work to determine uh, whether or not there's uh, issues in the soil or whether there's rock. Um, that isn't a perfect a guarantee. Um, so you can encounter it and that could create a change order. And then always there are some minor changes. Um, you know, the, you as the client haven't seen this building that we've designed in our heads until they start building it and maybe you wanna make an adjustment. So there's little changes. However, the project cost comes with a contingency to protect you against that. We don't wanna go back to the town for additional money. That money is, is there and available for legitimate and authorized change orders under the, the statutes of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So the, the, you have the ability to pay for modest adjustments in the scope without going back to the town. Um, if that money isn't spent, that's money you don't have to borrow later on. So uh, we have protections for the town to make sure that the amount of money that goes forward into this project is the amount of money that it gets constructed for. Does that answer the question? Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And. Uh, Rob, just a follow-up question to that. One of the questions was, how much is being included in the bid for contingency? Uh, that would actually be for Jeff or Rebecca. It's a percentage of the cost, but um, go ahead, Jeff. It looks like you're yeah, right. Usually, usually there are two contingency line items by the time you get to the bidding. Once we have the bid in hand, you usually want to make sure that you have about 5% of the construction costs, um, which... And then we also have a contingency on some of the soft costs that goes with it. For instance, you have materials testing that has to be done um, and some additional engineering work. Um, that, that is about $1.5 million. I am, Rebecca doesn't have the exact number right now with her computer down. Um, but that allows you, to, the 5% the allows you um, to cover the construction costs. I will tell you, um, I, uh, in new construction, typically we see less than 2% in change orders. So 5% is, is a pretty good margin. And also Rob, just so you know, we, we also run every week, every month, a budget report that indicates items that might've been under the budget and taking that money and putting it into contingency just for future uh, use later on. But we're watching that uh, budget very, very closely throughout the entire process. So there are no surprises that come up. Thank you. Mrs. Foglio, this question is for you. Uh, gentleman says, I sincerely hope that the town will not consider a 40 year note. And can you comment on the likelihood of this and further comment on why this is even an option? Okay, so the option came up, um, you can only do 40 years through USDA under Mass General Law. And we did investigate that. Um, one of the reasons we did investigate using a USDA loan um, is because you can lock in that rate um, relatively soon, like now. And then when you go out to borrow, you're, you get that interest rate. So it kind of hedges you from borrowing when the project is done in two years from now to whatever that interest rate is. It's one of the harder things for us to, to tell people how much something's going to cost when we don't know what the interest rate is going to be when we go out long-term in two years from now. The USDA loan, when you get approved, that rate gets locked in. And when you go out to borrow in say two years, that's the interest rate. So you know it ahead of time. Um, it is highly unlikely, I think, um, Andrew, you can confirm that we will not uh, pursue the USDA loan. Um, there is a requirement that we um, have a um, failure 
letter from not being able to get a loan from a financial institution, which is highly unlikely for Charlton. Um, so that would put us out of being able to use the USDA loan. Yeah, essentially we're in too good a financial shape to be considered for the USDA. Okay, so there's a follow-up question to the uh, project overrun. So it says, so the answer to my question is no. The cost of the project may exceed $28.5 million. I'm going to answer that. Um, town meeting is the, um, the appropriate form that appropriates money. They appropriated 28.5, it cannot go over that. However, if it something came up and they went back to town meeting, town meeting has the right to appropriate additional funds. However, it would not be part of a debt exclusion unless they had another debt exclusion question for that. The debt exclusion question is based on what's been already appropriated and, and quite frankly, what has not been borrowed yet is what the debt exclusion is for. Right, so again, this, this is probably one of the most hot button questions. So the, the answer is no, it cannot exceed $28.5 million without another town meeting vote. And right. if a debt exclusion were to be needed without the vote of another ballot question. Right. So the, the answer is no, it cannot exceed 28.5 million. And then again, just to reiterate, if the bid comes in at $24 million, with the exception of, as Tecton had stated, the minor adjustments that are built into the contingencies, they cannot come back to the town and say, sorry, it cost an additional 2 million more than we thought it was going to cost. That, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, question is, how much has been spent to date I can only tell you of the 28.5 that the selectmen and the finance committee authorized 1.4 to be borrowed to um, get documents for us to go out to the bid, which I think we've gone out to bid. I don't think the numbers are back yet. I'm, I'm not off the top of my head. I don't know how much of the 1.4 was spent, um, but they authorized up to 1.4 of the 28.5. We have um, we have some outstanding invoices still um, on there. I think the last number I had of the 1.4, we were hovering in the $500,000 range was was remaining in the accounts um, for um, this 1.4 project. And again, there were two line items prior to that. There was the 685, I believe, um, thousand dollar line item in 2018 um, that's been spent, and then there was the money. Um, Weston and Samson that we used for the space needs analysis, uh, that money has been spent. And, and unfortunately um, to the taxpayers, um, there's been a, a, a numerous am amounts of money that have been spent over the last 25 years. Um, every time we just start talking about this project, we hire another consultant, we hire another um, architect to come in and, and look at the project and um, we continue. I do not have the total number that we've spent over the last 25 years. Um, I, will, I will definitely try to get that. Okay, uh, we just had another question. Another question come in. So, if the contractor can't finish the building, then a work stop order is put out until the town approves the extra. This is a scenario that has never happened in my thirty-year career. We've always been able to finish the building within uh, the appropriated monies. Again, I, I will point out that Sutton did go back. For additional money, but that's because they added an entire communications townwide infrastructure into their scope. That's what they went back for additional money for. So it's in 30 years, I've never had a project that was not be able to be finished within the scope of the, the budget and the contingency. That's why the contingency is there to make sure that you have the money to finish the project. Thank you, Jeff. Did the town already spend $1.4 million on this project? Did I hear this correctly? Of the 28.5 million that was authorized at, appropriated at town meeting, 
the town has borrowed 1.4 million. They have not spent, according to Rob, they've they've got about 500,000 remaining in that authorization, that the borrowing that we did do. Now, again, Mrs. F Mrs. Foglio, if you could just clarify for the attendees, the 28.5 million is total, including the 1.4 that has been authorized for design services. It is not 28.5 plus 1.4. Correct. It's 1.4 is part of the 28.5. So, so Steve, I can, I can go a little bit more. Last 2019, when we came up with that $28.5 million number from Tecton, from their estimate, from their estimators, that included $1.4 million to finish the design of the building, go out for construction design documents, design development documents, actually go out to bid, um, which we're in the process of doing now. We, we created bid documents. They've been sent out. We've had sub bids come in. We've had GC bids are coming in now. And it allows us to have a true final cost in hand from a general contractor um, for what they're saying that the building is going to cost to be built. So that's the reason why, that's how we came up with that 1.4 number because that was included in the 28.5 from last May of 2019. We, if the voters would have uh, approved it in August, we would, we would have been in the design phase starting in August of 2019 until now. So that's that $1.4 million. So uh, we just essentially, uh, took out the 1.4 out of the 28.5 and now we've done the design of the building. So that leaves us with $27.1 million out of that 28.5 available. 27.1 and then we, the debt exclusion to the taxpayers will be minus the dollar amount that has been raised by the Capital Campaign Finance Committee, um, which again, we got that number from Noreen. So about $350,000 or so so the amount placed on the townspeople is the 27.1 minus that dollar amount of about $350,000. 2675, I believe. Steve, if I can interrupt. Chief. Uh, just looking at our uh, finances here, the public safety complex uh, account has 430,000 uh, left in it right now. So Robbie was pretty uh, much on point there with 500,000. Thank you, Chief. Okay, um, so I am not seeing any additional questions um, in the chat, but if there are any attendees that want to continue to put questions, I will continue to uh, monitor this. And as I'm saying that, one just came in. Uh, if approved, when would this project be completed? Um, I'll go and Rebecca, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe it's, if it's approved in November 3rd, we, we award the GC bid sometime in December, just before Christmas, the general contractor will then take the winter months to start doing as much, um, pre-planning as he possibly can. And, you know, site work, you know, other than obviously getting the excavators in the ground, just because of the, uh, the weather, you know, situation groundbreaking sometime in March and then a projected opening of the building in March or April of 2022, 2022, March or April of 2022 would be the completed cost. It's about a 13 month program um, construction timeline. Thank you. So again, if there's any attendees that want to continue to put questions in the chat, I'll continue to monitor that. Uh, but we want to take a few minutes right now to answer some of the frequently asked questions that we have seen on social media, um, not only over the period of time, but more specifically in the last uh, 30 days. So we've compiled um, these questions and, uh, you know, there's there's about 20 of them, but I think we're going to be able to go through them fairly quickly. Um, even though some of them may have been answered tonight, I, I think uh, just because these are some of the most frequently asked on a daily basis, I think it's worth taking a couple of minutes just to reiterate the point. Um, so, uh, Mr. Barton, I'll just throw all these questions out, and if you want to take them, you can, and if you want to defer them to someone, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, so the question was, I thought we voted this down. Why are we voting on this again? Why are there two votes for this project? Um, Donna or Andrew, 
you guys want to explain or even Noreen Johnson, you guys want to explain the whole town voting process? Donna, I think you're, you're muted. There you go, Donna. Donna, you're still muted. Okay, I can try. So the town meeting appropriates the money. The ballot question is just whether you want to repay that debt inside or outside the levy limit. It doesn't, the, the way the article was written when it was appropriated was not contingent upon a debt exclusion, which means you could go multiple times for a ballot question. And it doesn't mean that it disappears the first time that it's put on a ballot and is um, undoes the appropriation. Um, there's a couple of reasons why you would want to do that, um, especially on these larger projects. When we did this project um, May of 2019, um, we, it was really estimated numbers. Typically you would have done that 1.4 piece first and then gone back and, and asked for the debt exclusion and the borrowing and the appropriation for the construction. Um, it's hard when you do it, we put it all up front um, because you don't have those hard numbers. And that's why we went with the 1.4 to try to get better numbers in time for a ballot question. Um, it's also very difficult to do a ballot question in the middle of the summer. Um, a lot of people on vacation, um, people don't get a chance to come out to vote. Um, the selectmen have to approve to put a ballot question on for the taxpayers to vote. Um, they put it in August and then they've decided again to give it another try to put it on at a presidential election. Awesome. Uh, Noreen, do you wanna add anything or Andrew as far as the general public thinking when the vote failed in August of 2019 that the project was dead. I, I think Donna explained it um, well. I just don't know if you guys want to add anything else. Sure. Yeah. Andrew? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just, you know, I just wanted to basically add, I, I think that, you know, they made it clear that this is kind of like the only, they're only going to, this will be the last time for considering this project before, um, you know, the, the, um, it pretty much falls off the, off the table um, and, and let it and let it rest um, going forward. So, um, Noreen, I'll turn it over to you if you want to add any more. Oh, sure. I'll just um, take what Donna said and put it in layman, non-financial terms. That um, you know, the town voted in May to support the building of a project with this general of this general size. Um, because that was in the motion that was passed in May was a $28.5 million project. What wasn't decided at that uh, town meeting vote was how to pay for the $28.5 million. So what bucket of money does it come out of to cover the cost of the project? And the vote that failed was the initial vote to fund all of that money directly out of taxation on the citizens. And I think that was as the project information was evolving and the project was um, becoming clearer in terms of where there were cost saving opportunities, where there were financing opportunities and fundraising opportunities. So um, I think some people may have felt that that uh, second vote came rather quickly on the heels of the decision at town meeting and that we didn't have enough information at that time about the actual costs of the program, uh, of the project. Um, but I think this time around, it's really good timing for a reconsideration because we have a lot more information and the building committee and the architects have done a lot of work to think about the ways in which this project could be built in a, uh, as economical a way as possible um, and we're doing a lot of fundraising and having success at that. So I think uh, the combination of changes that have been made to the project, the fact that bids are gonna be opened next week, I think is really exciting to actually be able to pin down what the cost, um, anticipated cost of the project will be, uh, gives the voters a lot more information to make an informed decision. So I actually think it's, I know some people don't like it because they feel like they weighed in once um, 
but as someone myself who voted no on the original um, cost to vote in August because I thought it, we didn't have enough information to make a good decision. So I'm, I'm partly to blame for that as well. Um, I'm happy to go back to the polls and vote again because I feel like we have a lot more information now and the town has done its um, due diligence to really find the best way to make this project go forward. So. Thank you, Noreen. Yep. Thanks, Noreen. Uh, next question. Once the new public safety building is up and running, what happens to the existing buildings? Who maintains them or ensures they don't become eyesores if they are not torn down? Uh, Andrew or the fire chief? Okay, we would, uh, you know, as long as they're still municipal buildings, we, um, you know, own the, the maintenance of those and they wouldn't, you know, uh, we do have different plans for each building for reuse or um, or sale. Uh, specifically, I think the public safety for the, the police department. Uh, we still need some, um, you know, some additional conversations as far as what the true reuse of that building will be. But I believe it will either be uh, you know sold for continued use or will be reused as a as a municipal building. Uh, most of the other ones will, are in pretty rough shape and it will probably end up. Uh, being uh, sold as, as uh, to private properties. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next question is, why is this project so expensive? I would support a fire station. I, I, I'm sorry, I would support a fire station only for 10 to $15 million. Uh, Jeff? Rebecca, you guys want to take the 10 or $15 million fire station only projection? The, the fire station only? Well, let me start with why is the building so expensive? Um, you know, the fact of the matter is when I started doing public safety buildings some 30 years ago, uh, I did one for under $100 a square foot. Um, that's not the going rate for public construction in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts these days. Uh, it's been a long, long time since I've seen anything near that market. And I, I've watched over my career, the prices escalate. Uh, prevailing wages are a big piece of that. Changing codes are a big piece of that. Remember that the building that we're talking about here, it's different from every other municipal building in that the code requires it to be the building that's up and operational in the worst of circumstances. So our design loads for structural is much greater than other municipal buildings. Um, we, have to, we have to deal with greater security issues and greater issues of, of protecting information in these buildings. Um, so there's a lot of things that drive the cost. Believe me, my, my life would be better if construction costs for public safety buildings were still $100 a square foot because I, I get to do more of them. But the, the fact of the matter is, is the marketplace has set the cost for these kinds of buildings in reaction to the kinds of, of code requirements and operational requirements that go with them. And we have seen some pretty good escalation in those costs, um, particularly over the last two years um, in Massachusetts. Um, we've been able to, to look at um, cost escalations sometimes up to 6% a year. Um, so, you know, it's the marketplace that drives the cost and sets the value of these buildings. Um, and, you know, it, it's something that we have to work with. Now, um, the fire station only at 10 to 15 million. Um, based on your program, it's probably a little bit more than that, probably closer to the $20 million range um, to achieve the same thing as a police station only, um, total project cost. Um, but that was not the charge that we were given. Um, and so we have designed the public safety building. Um, and you know we've gone back to uh, the departments a couple of times along the way to talk about how we can, can reduce square footage and keep the the build is as, as modest as possible, um, but still keep in mind the obligation as a, as a public safety facility and the obligation to serve this community well into the future so that you're not revisiting it 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, Steve, you're, Steve, you're muted, just so you know. Um, Kevin, Kevin, can you weigh in at all? Kevin Heffernan, can you weigh in um, as far as didn't Tingsboro or Tewksbury, somebody just do a $10 million building and how would that compare in size to 
our fire station only. This our fire station only is projected to be at about twenty thousand eight hundred and eighty square feet. The closest one that we have that we've been doing lately would be Southboro, which was um, nineteen million dollars. So, but again, it, it's all driven by square footage costs, which, uh, as Jeff said before, have been going up over the past several years. The Tewksbury project is just a fire station only, um, but based on the size of the lot of land that they're using, um, that job came in around $12 million for that project. Um, but again, like, it's like everything else. It was driven by the cost of steel, cost of the subcontractors, all the trades that are, are uh, part of the project. So th these are costs that are already uh, applied to the overall budget estimate uh, when we go to um, the vote for the town as well as the town manager for their approval and the fire departments. But as far as anything close to similar, I guess the best one to say would be Southboro. It would be the closest fire station, police station combo that we have. Rob, another fire station only, like you're talking about kind of a, a fire station only option in that price range. Um, Natick also, Kevin, is right in that $13 million range um, and is about uh, the square footage is much smaller. It's a smaller station. Um, so really the cost per square foot, again, as Jeff mentioned, is equivalent. It's just less square footage. Um, so the, the price a point, it's a substation, correct, right. So it's just a different, it has different uses, different operations, but also its size is just smaller, um, which drives that cost down. And I'll just, I'll just add one other thing. The, the thing with Southboro is that that was a, um, I guess, um, out of the box, when that vote came in and that and those uh, um, estimates came in and the budgets came in at bid openings, they were much lower than anybody anticipated at that time frame. Uh, yes, of course, we'd love for that to be the same case now. Uh, however, we won't know. We just got the file sub bids in. We're getting the GC bids in shortly. So that's really going to set the table as far as what this project's going to really truly cost. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to actually ask a follow up question for myself, uh, only because this is uh, something that has gone around town and, and people are talking about it a lot it is this concept that they would support a $10 million building, or they would support a $15 million building. Based on the architectural programming of the building, with the square footage required to build a single fire station for the apparatus that is currently owned by the town, and to support all of the functions and needs. Is it possible to construct that building for $10 million? I would say today, no, it would not. Okay, thank you. Um, Follow-up question regarding the square footage. Uh, so Jeff, you had spoken about uh, in the past, it was $100 a square foot. What is the current rate uh, for square footage uh, at this point? Well, it, you know, again, it's it's moving all the time. Um, we have seen upwards of five hundred and fifty to six hundred dollars a square foot um, for public safety buildings, depending exactly where you are and exactly what's comprised in that. Um, I even have one that that's a little bit higher than that, um, but it has some some very special environmental um, green design features in it um, that drive that cost. So. Uh, you know, six hundred dollars is not an uncommon number per square foot for a construction cost. Thank you. Next question: Is there a concern with police and fire communications being in one building? Uh, fire chief, police chief, any one of you want to take that? Putting all operations in one building. Yeah, I mean, I, I can certainly speak to that a little here. Um, currently, as we speak, uh, we're, we're operating with uh, dispatch in the police station and fire is dispatched from police as well. Um, and due to the, uh, not the closeness, there's, there's lag time in call to service, dispatch times, response time. So some of that is included. I think uh, with a combined building, we'd be able to work more hand in hand with each other, uh, especially in a training aspect uh, with some of the uh, 
the difficulties we deal with in today's society, including active shooter events and stuff like that. So uh, anytime that we can uh, put these resources in the same building, I think you're gonna get a better product for the town. If I may um, add to that just a bit, um, you sure. know, the dispatch center, the shared dispatch that's located in the police department, um, we are designing to the most recent Massachusetts code, which has special requirements for the protection of emergency communications. Um, and we also pay a lot of attention to what's called NFPA 1221, which is the standard for emergency communication centers uh, that receive 911 calls from the public. And basically what that says is that portion of the building has to have an extra level of survivability um, in case of disaster. And that survivability doesn't mean that you can, you can sit there forever and operate out of that, but it means that if, if there was a significant challenge to, to the station or to the community, um, that at least it, it creates the opportunity for you to um, move your emergency communications to either a, a mutual aid or to a backup facility. But you know, some of those protections are two hour fire protection around emergency communication centers, um, redundant power supplies, um, redundant HVAC systems and protection um, against uh, uh, civil unrest. So all of those are in the new design and they aren't currently um, in the police station uh, where dispatch is today. Thank you, Jeff. Next question, we are in the worst economic times. How can we afford this building? Andrew or Donna? Um, I know that uh, at least when this started to be, uh, you know, considered for, or, you know, to be brought back up for consideration by the town, this happened well before uh, the beginning of uh, COVID-19. You know, this, this goes back to right after the, um, you know, the last debt exclusion vote that the, uh, the Board of Selectmen decided that it was going to kind of um, invest the money to, to give it a go for this uh, you know, well, you know, we understand that, you know, the economic times um, may be rougher. We have seen, um, you know, some positive numbers as far as public instruction coming down and also borrowing, uh, you know, the, the interest rates coming down. So as far as financing a public project, that really could be a much better time. It's just unfortunate that from the public's um, funding perspective, uh, it, it, it's not as easy. And, and unfortunately, when we started this project, you know, at least over a year ago, um, we couldn't have projected kind of where we were economically at that time. Thank you. Uh, just as a follow up, can someone speak to uh, escalation and what the escalation has has been or is on an annual basis? Jeff and uh, Becca. So um, we have seen it up to 6% in the past years on um, public construction. Um, right now with the COVID situation, we have been speaking with some um, major project management groups um, and we anticipate a, a softening in escalation. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough bid results from, from other architects, from other OPMs to really say that that is a strong trend. Um, we're anticipating, we're hopeful that we begin to see that with the bid results that we receive, um, that, that there may be a softening in that escalation and a reduction in cost. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the construction escalation has nothing to do um, with that, that sort of escalation, the, the consumer price index and the, the escalation of costs. It, it's driven by many other factors, um, particularly uh, the, the workload of the construction market. And you know, I, I, in, in Massachusetts, we, we've seen a lot of work in the recent years that has driven um, MEP costs up significantly, um, but also some of the other specialty trades, structural steel, um, masonry costs have gone up as well. Uh, Kevin, do you have uh, any additional thoughts or comments to add to that one? Uh, I think you hit it on the, on the head, Jeff. Um, we have seen them go up as far as 6%. Um, and quite honestly, we, we don't know what the driver is. Um, however, some of the things are a little bit more than others, like steel continues to go up. But as far as escalation on this project, we would hope 
to be around that 6%, if not less, in our estimate and the bids that we're going to be getting in. And as soon as we get those numbers, we're able to compare them to recent projects that we've started and opened up and see how the escalation and the cost differences are um, playing themselves out in that aspect. So we, we, we have a pretty good idea of what the escalation should be. And like I said before, Southboro was an anomaly. They were really lower than the estimate. Um, but we've also done other jobs where, unfortunately, they've been higher than the estimate. And sometimes it's just a roll of the dice. You, you really, truly don't know exactly what the escalation is going to be until the day of bid opening. Thank you. Uh, the next question. Um, hang on one sec for me. This question would be directed to uh, the police department. Why do you have four police cells and a padded cell? Hi, Steve. Uh, Danny Dowd. Um, so we, there's a few reasons for the padded cell. The padded cell is for somebody that's being destructive or harming themselves or the property within the cell. Uh, we currently use a restraining chair. There's a lot of controversy about that that requires somebody monitoring the person continuously while they're in the restraining chair. It involves getting them out involves taking vitals. So a padded room is, is sort of the, the trend society is going in so they can't harm themselves or others while they're in that room. As far as four cells, there's a lot going on now with the uh, uh, domestics. We, there's a six, the six hour cooling off period. So they're in a cell longer than they normally would be. Uh, we have no control over bails. A bail is set by an impartial clerk magistrate if they say it's five hundred dollars and the person doesn't have five hundred dollars they could be in a cell for you know two days waiting to raise that money we have no control how quickly they get out uh again domestics uh protective custody is a 12-hour window uh if somebody's in a cell they could be in there 12 hours while they're re recouping from alcohol so those are things that keep people in a cell longer than we would like them to be um again keeping children uh juveniles and uh, adults separated by sound and sight. Those are, you know, those are problems. And the fact that people are in them are, on, at times are in a cell longer than we would like. Thank you, Chief. I just wanted to add, Steve, to that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, one thing, just from a programming standpoint, um, Chief, if I could add, um, just so the public does know, we looked at that pretty heavily and that number of cells did um, come down. We looked at different approaches um, to the sight and sound separation. So each of these cells, um, although the quantity was reduced, they are unisex so that they are capable of being male, female, or juvenile, depending on um, what detainees are currently in holding, um, which, which gives them more flexibility, but doesn't result in, in more quantity of cells. Um, if multiple cells are within one block, they could only be used for mail. So it would limit their ability or flexibility depending on how many detainees. So um, there was a lot of um, thought that went into that quantity, but then also the design of each of those cells. Just real quick, Steve, just on, on the tail end of that, that's actually less cells than we have now. So that's a reduction in cells from the current police station. Yeah, currently we have four for adults, uh, males, and then we have uh, two cells that are can be utilized for either juveniles or uh, females. And um, obviously the, the padded cell would just give us an option. They're getting away from that trend of putting somebody in a restraining chair that's trying to harm themselves and, and, and can't warrant being sent to a hospital because they're the same problem there. So uh, that's, that's, it is a reduction and one of sort of is probably not going to be used until we need it. Excellent. Thanks, Chief. Uh, um, what is the cost to the average taxpayer per month per year? Let's see, just pulling that up. Uh, so the average cost per month 
of the average single family home value would be $18.79 per month. Okay. Um, we, I, I don't even remember at this point, I, this may have been answered already, but why is the project out to bid now without the funds approved? Jeff, Rebecca? Uh, well, the, the direction that we were given by, by the town um, was to proceed with the documents to bring in an actual bid number uh, for a debt override uh, vote. Um, so we have uh, worked diligently since that time um, to make sure that we have bids in hand prior to an election so that no longer will we be bringing an estimated number to the community, but an actual bid number to the community. Now, that, you know, again, there's still um, other costs associated beyond the hard construction costs that are accommodated in your budget. But if we see an under uh, a low bid, um, a lower bid than in the next couple of days, um, that certainly impacts um, the overall budget of the project. Um, but the, the, the important thing is we're bringing an actual cost to the, the community, uh, not an estimate. Thank you. Who sets the language for the ballot question? That language is provided by a uh, bond council which is basically our municipal financial advisor. And that language is crafted in, in conformity with Mass General Law. Thank you. Could we build a fire station now and add on a police station later? That certainly was an option and, and could be an option. I mean, obviously the plan that is out to bid today does not include that. Um, and to modify it would require a, a change in the process and a rebidding. Um, the one thing that I think you should be aware of is, is, you know, I mentioned earlier that at the beginning of my career, the cost per square foot was less. Um, if you build a, a fire station today and then come back and build a police station later, you will pay more per square foot, probably, most likely. I've never in 30 years seen the cost of construction go down. Um, except very, very briefly during, um, you know, economic times. Um, but then it restores itself and continues in an, in an upward climb. So, uh, yes, I mean, I think overall you're, you would expend more money uh, doing that. Um, you know, there's also there's other costs associated, you know, there's a thing called general conditions, and that's the cost of having a contractor on the site with all of their trailers and all of their equipment on that. So if you build them as two separate buildings, you'll pay general conditions on the building that you're building today. And then you'll pay again, general conditions on the building that you add on later on. So although it, it is it, it's a good strategy for dealing with um, lessening your investment today, I think long-term it probably results um, in an increased overall investment by a community. Very good. Uh, this question just came in on the Zoom. It says Sudbury, Medford, and Tewksbury are building new police or fire stations ranging from 18,000 square feet to 35,000 square feet. Those buildings in those three towns are estimated only at 11 to 18 million in value. The population of Charlton is 5,000 to 34,000 less than Sudbury, Medford, and Tewksbury. Why doesn't Charlton consider a smaller project that does not require an override increase in our taxes? Has Charlton considered any options that would not require an override increase in our taxes? So I don't know if, if anyone, it, uh, Jeff or Rebecca or, or, or even Kevin, I don't know if you have any information on the Sudbury, Medford or Tewksbury projects. Well, what I, what I can say is what you just pointed out, they were all police station only, um, which, you know, if we, we look at the police station component of the overall project, um, you know, the apparatus phase in and of themselves at a significant amount of square footage. Um, we're building a complete public safety building that serves both police and fire. And so they're not, they're not really comparables. 
Um, as to the question of whether or not the town of Charlton has considered other options, I'm going to leave that up to uh, folks from the town of Charlton. And Tewksbury was a standalone fire station alone. Kevin, do we know if that was a substation or was it a, a, a new uh, main? That's a brand new headquarters. Okay. That's to replace the existing one that's there right now. But I believe Tewksbury has two fire stations, correct? Uh, Tewksbury has a total of three. Right. And that's, you know, just uh, just to chime in, that, you know, that's that's an important piece for the public to understand is that, you, you know, you, you have to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples because a community may be building a new fire headquarters for, we'll say, $18 million. But if they have two additional substations that they are spreading apparatus across, then the square footage of that headquarters station doesn't need to be as large. With right. the town of Charlton is basically taking three separate facilities and moving them into one, the square footage is going to be bigger. If, if Charlton wanted to build a standalone fire headquarters and a satellite substation somewhere in town, then the square footage of headquarters would not have to be as big because some of that apparatus would be moved to a secondary station. So um, it is, it's very easy. And Mr. Barton, I'm gonna have you uh, just speak to the Dudley project, um, you know, because we, we scare, uh, share a regional school district, many people have brought up this Dudley project. Um, and I think that is a, a very good um, example of making sure that you're comparing apples to apples, not only in terms of you know, the square footage is important, but you have to look at the other factors in terms of how many stations does that community have and then when you look at those three stations, what's the total square footage of the three, which ultimately is going to be bigger than the standalone stations. But if you could talk about Dudley's um, project. Yeah, so um, we get compared to two stations, or two towns. Often we always get compared to the town of Leicester. They built their fire headquarters, um, I think for $9 million, if I think off the top of my head, and Dudley, um, we get compared to for their project of $6.8 million. Um, uh, specifically, Dudley, Dudley didn't build a new fire station for $6.8 million. Dudley just built an addition onto their current fire station, and then they renovated their first floor. Um, if you don't understand the project, then you wouldn't understand that the second floor of their building was used as space inside their fire station um, before they did the addition. So they had the use of the entire first floor and the use of the entire second floor. And then when they did their addition, they realized that they didn't actually have the correct structural components to use their second floor of their fire station. So even though they built a brand new apparatus floor and they renovated the first floor of the fire station, they actually lost, they lost the use of their second floor now. So um, in a sense, they did lose some square footage. So that's the reason why like you said, Steve, comparing apples to apples and, and uh, it, it's so important. Tewksbury has three fire stations. If we were to build three fire stations um, throughout the town, uh, yeah, I, I bet you that we could build them for, you know, 10,000 or 10, $10 million a piece and we would end up with $30 million total. Um, Lester, again, nine point something million dollars for their fire headquarters, but they still have two fire stations that they're uh, in need of replacing um, as well at some point uh, in their lifetime of that loan. So we, we looked at, or people think that our project is, is out of comparison to others because we have all of these high amenities that are going into the project. And, and unfortunately, it's just not the case. You know, I use the example of the town of Southbridge is looking at $28 million for a fire station only. The town of Auburn is looking at $40 million for a public safety facility. The town of uh, Northbridge just approved a fire station only for $20 million. All of the numbers that we're getting from Tecton and all of the architects, they're all within the same amount of dollar amount of what we're, what all these other communities are, are spending. Thank you. Uh, this question was already answered, but I'll just, sorry, did somebody say something? Yeah, before we move on, I thought the second part of that question was um, also interesting. Um, the uh, question relative to the financing options, and I wonder if Andrew might have, or Donna may have um, a partial answer, at least for that. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see the question anymore, but I, 
I know the question was both about the total cost of the fire station and then our options um, beyond a debt exclusion. Yeah, I, you know, I know that it was at least looked at for any way that the project itself within the, with the amount um, appropriate, it could be fit under the levy limit. Um, you know, that's why, you know, we were looking at the 40 year options and, um, you know, kind of how far out we could, we could space this project looking at, you know, anticipated future revenues uh, and, and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but in reality, you know, we, while we have to debt exclude the full project from a year to year budgetary basis, Andrew, you're frozen. We'll come back to uh, Andrew on that question. Um, another question just came in. If we had a fire station only, could it include the dispatch? Um, I'll say yes, it could, but there's some changes that happen. Primarily the changes happen are operational on the police side. And if the police chief wants to chime in as far as the concern with taking the dispatchers out of the, the police station and putting them in a new fire station. Um, Dan Dow just answering. So, you know, one of our concerns is that right now our dispatchers watch our prisoners, our dispatchers are uh, uh, basically meeting the citizens right in the lobby through the window answering questions, giving quick directions. Now that could change and it could certainly go to the fire department. But right now we'd have to replace it with personnel because they do a lot of police uh, support auxiliary services for us while they're dispatching as well for police and fire. So we need more staffing to offset that because they are right now monitoring our prisoners and also helping citizens. And they also notify police officers a lot of times accident report exchanges and things like that that normally occur in a police department when we get shifted to a different building. It would just probably inconvenience some citizens a little bit more. Thank you, Chief. Uh, it doesn't look like Andrew's back in, so we'll, we'll circle back to him. Um, what happens to the money that is left over after the building is built? Um, it Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it, it goes back to the town. So if the GC bid is for 23 million and we put two and a half million dollars aside for contingencies and soft costs, so that's 25.5. And when it's all said and done, we've only spent 24 million. Uh, that $1.4 million goes uh, back to the town. Um, okay. In some sense, Donna can chime in, that money probably was never even borrowed to begin with. Typically, you haven't finished your borrowing process at that point, and so if there's money left over, then you just simply don't borrow it. And, and then you would go back to town meeting and rescind that portion of the borrowing that was not unused. Very good. Thank you. How many sites were looked at before the one on Masonic Home Road was chosen, and how much was the land? And what happens if we don't build on the land? Um, the committee looked at six sites. Um, they looked at a site on North Main Street. They looked at two sites on Route 20. Um, and they looked at three sites on Trolley Crossing Road. And then we ended up with the site um, that we have right now, Masonic Home. We reached out to them. Um, they have uh, obviously a large amount of land. And we asked them if they'd be interested in selling us a portion of their uh, unused land and they uh, agreed. So they sold us the 19 acre parcel of land for $179,000. Very good. Um, excuse me, Rob, isn't there a contingency that that, excuse me, oh, isn't there yes. a contingency that that land goes back to them if not used for that purpose? Yes, I'm sorry. I forgot that there was another part of the question. Yes, um, we have uh, as part of the, the purchase and sales, they put a contingency of five years on that. So we have um, five years to build either, you know, to build a, a building on there. And if we don't build it within five years, then the, then it would revert back to the Masonic home and then they uh, pay us back our money. And Andrew, I don't know if you have any you know any more about that but that was what the last thing i had heard of was yeah that that's accurate um you know there is a 
uh, reverting clause in it that would be able to exercise their right after five years to um, get that, um, um, that land back. Thank you, Andrew. We're almost there. We have, I think, three, uh, two questions left. Uh, will the new building improve response times for police and fire? Uh, Chief Kanoff, you want to take the new building improving response time on the fire side? Sure. Um, where, where the new building is being proposed obviously gives us uh, a better starting point to uh, making it up the so-called Masonic Home Hill, um, clearly reducing our response time to uh, the southeast and southwest parts of town. Also, it's more centrally located, which was one of the big things in choosing the site. Uh, so that any, any one point in the outlayers of town uh, would be more readily uh, easier to respond to. So yes, it would uh, assist us in our response times. Very good. I would so we currently have eight attend. Uh, uh, I don't think sorry. it's going to. I don't think it's going to change anything with the police response. for right next door. I think it obviously has a lot more impact on the fire. Thank you, Chief. Um, so we have eight attendees still left on the call. I'll, I'll just put this out as the final call for questions. Um, I'm going to have, I have one more question that I'm going to ask uh, from social media, and then I'll check in on the Q&A uh, on the Zoom from these attendees that are left, and then uh, we'll just kind of do some closing uh, statements and we'll wrap it up for the evening. Um, uh, Rob, I don't know if you, you must have this slide in front of you. It's, it's um, question 19. But it addresses how big is the existing buildings, how big is the proposed building, and how big is it actually needed? Um, yeah, so we've uh, we've gotten this question uh, quite a bit, and we've uh, we've reached out to TechCon to give us a hand um, in answering this question. So we'll, we'll go with the existing buildings that we currently have. Headquarters is seventy five hundred and twenty square feet. Station two up in North Main Street is 2,160 square feet. And the Quonset hut that holds the tower truck is 700 square feet. That brings the total fire square footage to 10,380 square feet. Currently the police department is 8,238 square feet and their dispatch um, is 288 square feet um, as well. So, how big of a building do we need? Well, originally the space needs analysis that was performed by Wesson and Sampson came up with a, a space needs of 48,000 square feet. And one of our very first meetings that we had with Tecton and Vertex when we hired them was, what is 48,000 square feet equate to for dollars amount? And it was a ridiculous amount of money, like $39 million or something like that, which we knew uh, darn well that the taxpayers were not going to um, support that, nor did we feel that that was even a reasonable number to even expect the taxpayers to support as well. So we ended up starting doing some cost cutting, um, some square footage cuttings. We took some things out of the building and we scaled it down to um, its current size. So our current total size for the project is 40,300 square feet. Um, that breaks down to uh, 20,000 or 21,000 uh, square feet for the fire department. So um, essentially doubling the size of the fire department um, the police department um, in the new building will have nearly 1,300 square feet, so giving them an additional uh, 500 square feet. The dispatch is a, is a very large addition to their current square footage, and you can just tell by the square footage that and how cramped they are and how much additional space they need, but the new dispatch would have about 1,400 square feet. And then we've also added the uh, training room, emergency operations center, uh, community room, which is that large glass um, room uh, on the second floor. So that space there is 5,100 square feet. Um, we've never had that building. Uh, in the event of a, a major emergency in the town of Charlton, where we had to bring together department heads um, from multiple different venues, uh, we had to bring in NEMA, um, CERT, uh, DPW, 
you don't have a, a room available to actually manage a major incident such as a, uh, a long hurricane, a serious hurricane or a tornado or a major blizzard or an ice storm where power was knocked out um, throughout the town for a long duration. So this new room, this 5,100 square foot room adds an emergency operations center into the town, allows us to uh, help mitigate the incidences a little bit easier. But in addition, um, it allows it to be used as a training room for both the police and fire departments, um, as well as hosting regional classes. Um, and then lastly, it's another community room for any uh, agency or any organization in the town of Charlton to use. If you've been involved with town of Charlton, I, um, I sit on a few other boards. It's very difficult to get meeting spaces to hold meetings. And this is just another one of those rooms that would be available to anybody in the town um, if they wanted to use the room for a, a meeting, such as like a, a little league or a softball or a basketball league or Pop Warner. Um, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, you know, the, the list can go on and on. This room would be available for anybody in the public to use. Just a, a minor clarification there, that 5,100 square feet is, is the public space of the, the facility, not just the one room. That includes uh, the triage room, the restrooms. Um, Okay, uh, so that concludes uh, all of the questions um, that we've received. And I, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, the majority of those questions that I just read in this last section were questions that were dissected from social media that have been the most popular, um, you know, since this project started. Uh, and then I, I wanna thank the remaining attendees, uh, the eight, uh, soul survivors that, that have, have le uh, stayed with us till the end. We really appreciate uh, your time and your questions. And, and they were really some great questions um, that we got answered uh, tonight. So uh, uh, Andrew or Mr. Barton, uh, does anybody have any closing statements or anything that you'd like to say? CharltonPublicSafetyBuilding.com is, uh, is a website that's been uh, um, put up and it has all of the resources for people to make an educated decision. Um, I've yeah. said all along through this whole process is, you know, get the information you want. If you, if you can't support the project, you know, for a variety of reasons, I, I get it, we understand, you know, we're just trying to stop the kicking of the can down the road and we're just trying to deal with this project um, that we have in front of us and you know, really take care of a, a, a multifaceted problem with one building. Um, and if you have any other questions on that webpage, there is a, a, a link that you can send an email um, and you can get your question directly answered if you didn't want to uh, post it in this type of forum. Yeah, and I'll add to that, Rob. Um, you know, I know I saw a couple of questions about, you know, clarifying uh, financial statements and stuff like that. Um, all those updated financial figures are up on that are up on that website. If you want to look that up um, under the financials tab. Uh, and as you said, too, if anybody has a question or is looking for additional information that might have been mentioned, but maybe they can't find, put it in that question. We get, we'll continually try to upload anything anybody's looking for. Excellent. Are there any other panelists that have any closing statements? If so, just unmute yourself and uh, speak. So I'll just remind people that <clears throat> one of the questions was about how to pay for the project without raising taxes. I mean, that is why we're uh, working very hard to fundraise for this project to reduce the tax burden um, because that is how cities and towns build new projects and maintain their infrastructure is they use our tax dollars to do that. So through the public uh, fundraising effort, it's an opportunity to offset the burden that is passed along through a tax increase. And if anyone would like to help, we are an all volunteer committee. There's some really nice uh, ladies and gentlemen who are working on that committee. So if you wanna meet your neighbors and come out and help us, we'd be happy to have you join us. Thank you, Noreen. Any other panelists? All right, Ralph, just make sure you close uh, the meeting before we log off. You're on mute now, Ralph. Need to make a motion to uh, close the, the the meeting from uh, public safety. 
Is there a motion? G for Dan, Derek. I'll make the motion. Motion's made. Is there a second? I'll second. 